Good morning. I'm going to call the February meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee to order. Today, as the first item on the agenda, the board will accept public comment on the proposed amendments to the Regents University of Minnesota traffic regulation ordinances. Uh, this public hearing was noticed in Anoka, Carver, Clearwater, Dakota, Hennepin, Isanti, Olmsted, Oak, Ramsey, St. Louis, Stevens, and Washington counties. Uh, before we do receive public comment, I would like to invite Vice President Bertelson to give us a quick overview of the proposed amendment. Vice President, when you're ready, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Regents. As we are here today, in accordance with Minnesota statutes, um, the Board of Regents will have a public hearing on amendments to the Regents of the University of Minnesota Traffic Regulation Ordinance. These have not changed since our last meeting uh, review. The proposed amendments are the result of a comprehensive review and address new modes of transportation, changes in traffic patterns, and responds to the needs of the university community. They primarily address the following broad categories. Definition and regulation of motorized foot scooters, definition and regulation of personal assisted uh, mobility devices, definition and regulation of dockless bicycle sharing, provision of restricted vehicle zones and specialty use parking, elimination of the permit requirement for mopeds, clarification on the use of the transitway in the Twin Cities campus, definition and regulation of stopping and standing, minor, minor edits for clarity, accuracy and completeness and readability throughout. Um, and again, as I said, no changes have been made since the committee reviewed the proposed amendments at the December 2018 meeting. <coughs> Thank you, Vice President Burleson. Um, before we start, I want to remind the audience about the purpose of today's public hearing and the procedures we will follow. This is an opportunity for the university community and the public to voice their opinions regarding the proposed amendments to the traffic regulation ordinances. The board also invited written comments to be submitted with enough time for regents to review them before today. No written comments were received by the Office of the Board of Regents. We do have one speaker signed up. I will call the speaker's name in just a moment. When I do, please come to the presenter's table and for the record, provide your name and affiliation, whether you're a student, faculty member, staff, community member, etc. Microphones do not need to be adjusted and you'll be allowed two minutes. Mr. Langworthy to my right here will hold up a yellow sign when 30 seconds are left and a red sign when your time is up. I think we are now formally open to the public hearing on this item. If the speaker is here that is signed up, they can step to the podium and mention their name and, and status. Hello, uh, my name is Sina Rogani. I'm a sophomore in electrical engineering in the College of Science and Engineering. Uh, I am involved in a student group which um, is building uh, electric vehicles, including a, an electric scooter. I've been riding scooters for over three years now. Uh, I'd like to first applaud the board on their thoroughness in the legislation and not implementing any blanket bans on um, electric transportation. Um, I'd like to note that the maneuverability of non-motorized electric scooters it significantly differs from that of motorized electric scooters and in that um, motorized scooters have higher weights and are therefore unable to stop and um, accelerate as quickly as non-motorized scooters. Uh, and in the ordinances, um, um, the operation of motorized um, scooters um, has been banned within university buildings. But in ordinance number four in article three, section three, um, there's no explicit ban on the operation of non-motorized uh, scooters inside of buildings um, if that use is prudent. Um, I'd like to note that um, and um, suggest uh, potentially um, being more clear about the use of those inside of buildings. Um, I'd also like to note that there's no explicit clause on the use of non-motorized scooters in areas, in areas such as the Scholar's Walk. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Do we have any additional speakers? Okay, if not, I'll obtain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? 
If not, all those in favor of quote. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have a question about, and I'm not going to be able to say which section and all that fun stuff this is, but uh, there's a, <clears throat> a piece in here that looks new that says, for the purpose of the regulations relating to time-limited parking, any vehicle moved a distance of not more than two blocks or 600 feet during the time-limited parking period shall be deemed to have remained stationary. Regent Omari, I am going to ask you to hold that question. This motion is just to close the public hearing and then oh. we're going to discuss the deal. Okay, so if that's fair, I didn't catch that. So we've got a motion on the table to uh, close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The public hearing is closed. So now uh, we're going to move to action on the proposed amendment on the traffic regulation ordinances. Vice President Bertelson or Director Allenson, are there additional items you want us to address before I ask questions or comments from the board? No? Okay. So at this time, I'm going to ask for a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the adoption of the amendments of the Region of the University of Minnesota traffic regulation ordinances. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. So now I assume Red Regional Mares has a question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, so that that uh, part of the the provision here, I, I I understand it. And as a student who used to park for two hours and then go move his car half a block so that I didn't get a ticket, um, I would have gotten a whole lot of more tickets if I had done that. And so I'm trying to figure out from a practical standpoint why this makes sense. Um, and that's because Vice I President couldn't Bertelson, afford the parking you, you would come up here. Director Allenson, if you want to come too, just in case. We'll be ready. You'll be ready. We'll rapid fire. Did you hear the question? Yes, sir. Go um, ahead, Mr. Sir. Chair, Regent Amari, I hear your point. And having gotten some of those same tickets myself over the years when I was a student here, um, I think the issue is that um, the policy is to make to define what short-term parking versus what's long-term parking. And then we do have long-term parking options on campus. This is sort of to line us with what the city of Minneapolis does. And so people, as you said, just don't move a couple of spots and then move up, use more short-term parking. We intend short-term parking for people who have business of this long. And we do have long-term parking um, in a variety of different you know, uh, price points and locations on campus. And we encourage people, if they need to be here for a long time, to use those, to use those options or public transportation between. I'll wait to, I need to gather my thoughts. Regent Shue. Uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I look at this and it, it just seems to be difficult to enforce. And uh, I understand the intent, but uh, you know, we're, are we asking our um, people who write tickets to uh, produce evidence that your car had moved less than two blocks or 600 feet? I mean, how would we even enforce this? Um, Mr. Vice Chair, President Regent Shu, um, I mean, from a practical matter, we don't have a GPS or um, our, that kind of spine network to, to track exactly how many feet everything moved. In large part measure, um, the truth would be it's, uh, it'll be tracking whether a car moved from one spot 10 feet or 15 feet ahead in order so that they're not at the exact same space. So um, we have to try to send a message about its use and our functional purpose practically. Um, we would, um, our traffic enforcement folks drive around enough and they recognize where people are because um, we don't have all that much, you know, and not an overwhelming amount of short term parking in those spaces. And we tend to see, and when, when this does happen, people are moving a couple, a spot or just a couple spots um, immediately adjacent. And so I think that's what would really be caught. Agent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Uh, well, Vice President Bertelson, I, unless we're photographing people um, where they park all the time, I don't know how we would even know necessarily that a car only moved one spot or two spots or two blocks or you know whatever. So I just find this very hard to, I find it very hard for a student or any motorist to dispute whether or not they, they did or did not move more than 600 feet. Um, you know, I, I do not carry a tape measure in my car that would uh, 
be able to, you know, if I even wanted to try and, you know, meet this particular ordinance, I don't know that I would necessarily be able to do that. And then you're talking about two blocks. Uh, again, very difficult to, to prove that I did and very difficult for us to prove that someone didn't do it. So I'm just <coughs> suggesting that we have uh, more enforceable language for this. Okay. Good. Point taken. Regent Rocha. Unless the Regent uh, Omari want to wait. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, this, uh, we're kind of down in it right now. This is pretty deep. But, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that I ever did this, but you know, back, <laughs> back in the day it was, you know, they chalk your tires, right? Right. And you take a rag, and you go out and you wipe the chalk off your car, and you're, you 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 reduce the the time limit. I, I my my personal feeling from an enforcement standpoint, and also just there's some other considerations. You might have somebody that has ambulation issues, right? They might have a hard time walking or you know whatever, and and two blocks is, might be a long distance for that that individual. So if they're using that, you know, I, I think stationary is stationary. If the car is still in the same spot, but if you move it and there's a spot available, I don't know how. You having parked there suddenly puts you behind all of humanity for getting the next spot that opens up. My preference would be just to consider stationary stationary, um, which I think would probably address the issue. I, I'm not prepared to bring a motion, but were someone to do that, I would be supportive. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. Regional Mari, do you have? Yeah, thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, we are down in it, so I take credit for that. Um, <clears throat> I think I think part of you know, Regent Shu's point is uh, the enforcement is challenging, but I never fought a ticket when I got a ticket at the University of Minnesota because I didn't even know how to. And so I actually think a piece of it, too, is there's a, a large level of discretion where, where tickets might be given. And I don't think the average freshman student on the University of Minnesota campus who is commuting, clearly, because they have their car and has jobs and, and other things, is going to dispute it. So in actuality, <laughs> they're just paying the ticket. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> I get the spirit of why we're doing this. Uh, I think the practicality of it uh, is something else and might have some unintended consequences. Um, so, unless there's other comments, if I may make a motion, I would. Uh, I would actually move that we strike that, uh, let me see, I probably need to know the exact section. In Article three, uh, section three, uh, bullet point D of the policy. <clears throat> Or the ordinance. Okay, uh, Mr. Langworthy will repeat the motion here. The Omari Amendment would strike in traffic ordinance number two, Article 3, Section 3, 5D from the text. 5D. Can you, excuse me, can you, can you please repeat that? Yes. So the Omari Amendment would strike from Traffic Ordinance 2, Article 3, Section 3, 5D, and this is on page 11 of the docket materials. Can you read what 5D says there? For the purpose of the regulations relating to time-limited parking, any vehicle moved a distance of not more than two blocks or 600 feet during the time-limited parking period shall be deemed to have remained stationary. Okay, thank you. Is there a second to that motion? I'll, I'll second the motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burnett, you want to? Talk? If I can, just for members of the board, I, there's no question number of rules and regulations aren't always the easiest to enforce. <clears throat> but what I might offer is, I think the general intent is short-term parking is meant to turn over. And without this on the books, I would just submit to you, there's no way for our folks to um, deal with th folks that abuse it. And so while it might not be able to be perfectly um, enforced, I think ha having the intent that short-term parking is not meant to be abused, I think was the intent of putting this in the regulation. So just food for thought. Mr. Chair. Okay, Regional Mark. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, intent is great, and I love positive intent, but positive intent does not equal outcome or impact. And so I just want to be clear that I, I appreciate the intent of this. As I mentioned earlier, I'm more looking at the potential outcomes that might not be intended. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, I would just note that this concept also appears under um, 
Section 4, um, 4 3 B. And I'm, I guess I'm not sure how many other places it, it might appear, but um, this, this concept is not just in one place. It's at least in two okay. places that I've seen. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, you know, we do have a motion on the table to strike that. We've had discussion. Um, Regent uh, McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I'm, uh, I, I guess I'm just a little reticent to engage in rewriting regulations kind of on the fly here. I, I appreciate the dialogue, and I think this is very difficult to enforce, but I worry that what we may do around the uh, table here on a moment's notice could be have equally unknown and unintended consequences. So I'm, I'm just concerned about that. Thank you, Regent McGill. I have the same, you know, I'll, I'll take my prerogative here from the chair. I have the same issue that we went through a lot of this. And, um, you know, maybe the best thing today is I, I don't know if, if we don't vote on it or we pass it and bring it back. I'm not so sure we want to be rewriting the issue at this table without legal counsel and everything. That being said, Regent Rocha, you are. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I you know, I, I find no quarrel with anything anyone said here this morning. I, I um, my first interest is, is, is the lost ticket revenue going to cause a tuition increase as, as, long as, as long as we're not having that impact? Um, I, I would have no problem. Um, again, I, I'll, I'll follow the lead of the maker of the motion. I, I, um, I think that this is really less about in, unintended consequences. The only, the only consequence of this is I think you're just going to decriminalize activity that already happens. So people that need to park are parking where they need to park, and the question is whether we're, you know, Again, uh, creating criminals out of people who are acting not, not necessarily with nefarious intent, but, um, but sort of rational acting under the circumstances. So I, I appreciate the fact that this is unusual for the board to be at this level of, of uh, detail, but uh, to the extent that my colleague has raised an issue that does have an impact on the student experience on campus, I, don't, I, I, I find it to be an honorable pursuit as well. So I'll follow his lead. If, if, the, if the motion stands, I'm going to vote for it, but I certainly would support a withdrawal to uh, to let administration to you know take a, another gander at the issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, given what Regent Shu has mentioned, that there are other areas that I clearly missed. That removing that is not going to make any sense because they're just going to enforce it with one of the other sections. So uh, I'll leave it up to you in this body to decide if we postpone it or not. Thank you, Regent Omari. So that I, I'm taking that as withdrawing the motion at this time. So my question is, do we want to? I'm going to ask the colleagues at the table. Uh, do we want to pass the motion as is and come back, or do we want to table it? What what it, what is and, and maybe we need legal. I, I mean, that's my, my my understanding is we, we've had a public hearing, so we don't have to have another public hearing. But um, I guess I'm kind of lost. I, I'm looking for some guidance here if we want to actually pass this motion, or do we want to uh, table it to come back? Um, Vice President Burleson. Two, two things, Mr. Chair. One, to Regent Shu's point, there, um, he did identify the only other section that relates to the topic at hand. So it's not uh, in 10 different places. It's only in those two specific ones. Uh, the second is, I guess, uh, my general sense is we can certainly respond to that a direction to this topic. Um, I think the, there's a large variety of issues that would be good to have in place because we know yeah. this uh, negotiations about with scooter companies will be coming up soon. In spite of, I was encouraged to talk to you about the maybe we should add studded tires to the scooter section. Um, I got that <laughs> in for you, Matt. Um, but I think to get the, the rest of the things in place would be helpful. That gives um, me some direction, Vice President Burleson. So, so what, what I see here is that we do have zero motion on the table for amendments. We do still have the original motion to adopt this, is where I believe we are at. Um, so what you're telling me is if we adopt it, we can adopt it, and you will go back with legal counsel and look at it and bring us, bring us another uh, form that we can re-adopt later. Is that what I'm hearing? I um, believe that's the case, and I'll look into my, this is where you call a friend, I'm looking at my legal counsel. He's back. There they are. Right here he comes. <laughs> Mr. Is it Mr. Piper? Well, he's coming. The other, only other thing I'd say is, I mean, the other component that plays into why this, the purpose of this was um, part of the purpose for us for having short-term parking is folk, to try to address for people who have access disability 
issues to try to, as another way to encourage to free up those spaces um, for able-bodied folks to find other locations so others who have limitations can get to the closest spaces. That was one of the drivers that doesn't go to the practicality of uh, addressing it. Mr. Mr. Piper, would it be uh, best for us to adopt the ordinance today and have you come back with some changes, or is it best not to adopt the ordinance? Chair Anderson, I think it's best that you not adopt the ordinance um, at this point if you want us to do more work, because once we adopt the ordinance, um, the, ador the ordinance would have passed. We would have a passed ordinance, and then we'd have to amend it again. We'd have to go through the, the notice okay. period again. Regent Rocha, did you have? I have a question, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, and I, and I don't know the specific areas we're talking about, um, but how does the public know this rule? Is it on signage that says if you move less than two blocks or 600 feet? I mean, because this would not be intuitive to me, right? That I mean, my thought is if I'm parked here and I can't be there more than two hours, if I move my car and I'm in a different place and it's a block away, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that that's in violation. How, did, how does the public know the rule? Um, uh, Vice President Burleson. Mr. Chair, Regent Rocha, um, it would be incumbent upon us to make it part of our communication uh, messaging to the institution. Um, and um, we would post it in the, on the uh, website and in other places that we tend to share that. I mean, I, um, Mr. Mr. Chair, if I can follow up, then, you know, I, I mean, that sort of answers itself then. I mean, you, you get some, some, you know, valedictorian from the city of Wilmer comes rolling into town, probably not going to go to the website to check the ordinances to know the 600 foot or two block rule. So I think the average person would consider stationary to be stationary. So that would, that would be my preference. And so if, if, if it's a function of, of addressing it, the, the additional clause that was addressed, I think that's just a carve out from this rule, which means if you went back to stationary means stationary, then you wouldn't need that additional rule because it wouldn't, it wouldn't apply. So I'm, I'm becoming stronger in my belief that, just out of common sense, this is probably a good, a good change as proposed by my colleague. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair. I'm just wondering how important it is for you to have something in place when you negotiate with stu scooter companies, because we don't meet again for a while. So I'm just... Um, Mr. Know. Chair, Regent Lucas, I think it would be helpful. Uh, that mandatory, probably not, because we created a short-term plan without it, but I think it does give guidance and address um, the world of motor, not to um, dockless bikes, and there's a lot of new kind of modes of transportation that we need to deal with, and this would give us ability to better um, to work on with both uh, those companies and with uh, better communicate with um, backing for students in the community. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, uh Unless the city of Minneapolis has the same practice, and we are in the city of Minneapolis, and these meters are, are um, you know, some are our meters and some are Minneapolis meters. So unless Minneapolis uh, enforces in the same manner, then there, that would give rise to some confusion um, going back to this issue of what, what's the expectation. Um, do you have an answer for that, how they do um, it? This is a mirroring of the city of Minneapolis. We took their language. So that somewhat makes a difference. Mr. Chair, so my to take from that then that they enforce they enforce their meters throughout the city in the same manner as it relates to short term parking. If that's the case, um, and I wasn't aware of that, but um, uh, if that's the case, then that's a compelling reason to support what we're proposing. Regent Beeson, I think from from my pulpit here, I think that's a that's a great. Uh, that's a great uh, thing to find out that we have the same mirrored ordinance. Uh, Regent Shue. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, <clears throat> on that point, um, I don't think this is the meter regulation. This is the non-metered short-term parking, I believe. And, you know, because I think if you go from one meter to another meter in Minneapolis, you're good, as long as you pay for it. Um, Mr. Chair, Regent Shue, it's, um, it would be both meters, anything that's time limited. So it would be meters as well. Um, and then to Regent Beeson's point, um, Yes, we are in the city of Minneapolis. We don't have city of Minneapolis parking enforcement within our border. Um, we, that's sort of a, a role and responsibilities we've worked out with the city that within the boundary of the campus, now next to the campus, right outside the campus, all around the campus, that's a different matter. We don't do those. Okay. Uh, we are, we are at a, you know, a time limit here, and we do have, the motion is to adopt the traffic ordinance since the amendment has been taken away. 
So I am going to call a vote on that if, if, if nobody objects. I'll move to postpone. <laughs> is, there, is there a second to postpone the vote? With no second, we're going to move to the vote. So, Mr. Chairman, clarification. You move to postpone. Is that is that you mean to lay it on the table? I do not but know. That's there. I don't think there's a motion to postpone. There's a motion to lay on the table, uh, which has the same effect. Point of order, Mr. Chair. That's actually the correct motion. Motion to postpone would be the taking it off the table at this moment. But I, I don't know that we have to get into that. I think we're heading to a vote. So I'm, I'm, I'm lost here, is, but it, does it need a second? It does, it, does. it does need a second. Okay, we do not have a second. So <clears throat> with that being said, we do have a motion for approval of the resolution related to the adoption of the amendments to the Regents of the University of Minnesota Traffic Ordinance, and it has been seconded. So at this point, I'm going to ask all those in favor of adoption of this motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burleson, uh, the last thing I'd like to tell you is, is uh, I think the student raised some great questions about uh, in buildings, out of buildings, motorized, non-motorized. If you could just listen to his concerns at some time. Duly noted. Thank you. Okay. We are going to move on. The next item on the agenda is uh, College of Science and Engineering tuition surcharge. Uh, I've got Dean Moss Keva here, along with, it says, Associate Vice President Tonneson is going to be presenting. And uh, we'd like you to move forward at a expeditious pace. <laughs> we got behind a little bit right off the bat, but we'll catch up. It's my ploy for you to be late and me on time later. Well, we, want, we want Regent Spigum. We want Regent Spigum to be able to have lunch on time. That's, a, that's the name of the game. So I guess uh, we are ready for your presentation whenever you are ready to start, folks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, good morning. Thank you again for giving us an opportunity to uh, appear before you to present this uh, proposal, the College of Science and Engineering tuition surcharge. So I will just very briefly um, summarize um, the, 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 uh, what we had presented <clears throat> last December, uh, just to remind you of this before going to the motion. So the College of Science and Engineering proposes to expand the existing $1,000 per semester tuition surcharge that the uh, Carlson School of Management has to the undergraduates in the College of Science and Engineering programs. This would apply to all CSE undergraduates, including transfer students, and it would apply also to CLA, Bachelor of Arts degrees in College of Science and Engineering programs, which are the sciences indicated. In this, uh, in this slide. Pell and you promised student, the eligible students would not pay the surcharge, and this would not apply to any of the current students ever in the College of Science and Engineering. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the, um, the, the, the surcharge will be um, effective for students being admitted, uh, entering College of Science and Engineering in fall 2019. Um, some, uh, some of the summary of what we estimate uh, the impact will be in terms of the uh, additional income is that after a four-year phase-in, we expect that this would generate uh, about $12 million, 25% of which is returned, in essence, to, um, to offset the um, surcharge for Pell and you promised students, leaving a net of about $9 million. Uh, College of Science and Engineering enrollment growth would also generate additional input because, as you may recall, a big part of the motivation for this uh, surcharge, which is in line with um, the programs in engineering at all Big Ten schools, among some other universities, is, in fact, to provide the resources for us to, uh, to, to increase capacity and expand our program because that's where the big demand is. The initial expenditures are focused to, in fact, uh, affect that, that uh, capacity expansion, in particular related to uh, a number of facility needs that we have, uh, and they are listed here. The chemistry teaching laboratory, which is at Fraser Hall, um, 
renovation actually is a bonding request that we hope will be uh, in front of, uh, with you uh, next year. And uh, then we have um, a set of dominoes with respect to the Pillsbury Hall uh, renovation, which includes Lind Hall being now returned to the College of Science and Engineering programs that have to be renovated. Major renovation needs for Vincent Hall, Shepherd Laboratories, and so forth. Um, instructional laboratories have to be expanded to, to uh, not only uh, actually accommodate the current students, but also the uh, expansion that we plan. And, um, and then we need faculty. We, we were in a highly competitive situation for, with respect to faculty in the College of Science and Engineering, but we need to uh, recruit and retain these faculty to uh, provide the instruction and, of course, the research for, uh, for our college. So um, as part of the plans, and we have been having these discussions, or certainly from, with, with the provost's office, we, uh, we have uh, plans to add another 100 students uh, through the freshman uh, admission uh, in each of the um, next three years. Of course, we are going to improve the quality of the instructional laboratories as part, with, with the resources that are obtained and, um, and the experiential learning that we provide to our students. <clears throat> and um, as I have indicated, of course, to, uh, to keep our faculty, <coughs> outstanding faculty. Thank you for the opportunity. So that's a summary of what we had presented before. And uh, there's a motion. Mm -hmm. The um, resolution is before us at this time. Um, again, it's probably best that we, we get mm -hmm. a, uh, get the motion put on the floor and then we can discuss it. So I will accept the uh, motion. I'll move its adoption. And its adoption, is there a second? Second. And it's been seconded. Great. It's on the, it's on the uh, <clears throat> floor for uh, discussion. Is there any discussion among the board? Student, region, uh, student Representative Kraft. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dean Cave, Associate yes, Vice President you. Tonneson. Current CSE students understand the motivations behind the addition of the surcharge. <laughs> CSE students, including myself, a mathematics student, agree that buildings like Vincent and Smith are in need of serious improvements. When visiting Vincent Hall, which houses our School of Math, uh, recently receiving prestigious awards like uh, those from the NSF uh, to study quantum computing, whether that building has air conditioning or other amenities, uh, basic amenities, should not be a question that a prospective student needs to ask themselves. Students are also aware um, that CSE's size is, uh, size is at capacity and limited by av available facility space. At the same time, it cannot be overlooked that this is an increase in the cost of attendance of the university and its timing with the recent vote to increase non-resident, non-reciprocity tuition by 10% um, requires um, us to put all this in, into perspective. So for example, the tuition rate faced by an incoming student in fall 2019, say from Illinois, studying electrical engineering, the tuition rate faced uh, by that student would be approximately $4,880 more than the current tuition rate faced by um, another Illinois student currently studying mechanical engineering at this year's uh, rates. A crucial difference between an increase like the one before the board today and last uh, and Decem the December vote on NR and R tuition is that this would affect no current students in the programs and current students appreciate that. <coughs> current students, the one who use these facilities on a day-to-day -day basis, are saying, are telling me that their edu educational experiences would be enhanced by the suggested improvements made possible by the revenue generated. The concern for the steepening burden on students and their families should be taken into consideration. If the board votes to implement this surcharge, the revenue generated, um, the students would like the rev revenue generated to go towards those no noted building improvements and facility expansions. And we hope that those robust conversations on affordability and access to the university continue through the monitoring and evaluation of the impact that this has on, uh, of the surcharge on enrollment. And now a brief question that I uh, have. As I understand the system in place for the Carlson School of Management and their tu uh, uh, tuition surcharge, a Carlson student taking up to but not more than eight credits would pay $100 um, as sort of a graded sur surcharge. Um, and I would seek clarification from the presenters on whether the CSE tuition surcharge would also have that gradation uh, for, say, part -time, a part-time student studying computer science. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kraft. Do either presenters have any information on a gradient of? Uh... Uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, this fee will be implemented exactly like the Carlson School of Management f surcharge would be. It currently is operating. I don't actually know what the part time. Um, I have to, would have to look that up, but whatever it is in Carlson, this would apply here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you finished, Mr. Kraft? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I, I intend to support this, uh, this additional surcharge, and uh, I have a couple questions for, for Dean Covey, and uh, I think they relate primarily, well, I know they relate primarily, how do we go about as we use the money to increase our capacity to educate? So we're going to add 100 students. And some of that's buildings, some of that's professors, some of that's you know equipment, well, all the different things. Is it is it really just a function of the market? So, for instance, are we going to add you know seventy five computer science degrees and five chemical engineering and you know make up whatever mix you have there? Give me a flavor for how we go about matching our ability to educate and to grow the number of graduates we have with with our sense of what is Minnesota's public and private sector employers need the most from the university. Dean Kuei. Regent McMillan, that's an excellent question. It's something that um, I and my colleagues spend a lot of time actually um, uh, consulting with, with, um, with those who hire our students. Uh, as you may know, we have a very robust um, Career Services Office, as, as part of our student affairs. Uh, we hold two uh, major career days, basically, where, where employees, uh, em, em, employers come um, and, and we're actually oversubscribed often for those. And we take their input, but they tell us who they are looking for. Um, our advisory boards at our departmental levels and at the dean's level provide that information for us. We know the need is actually across the board. Uh, just last week, I was visiting one of our um, civil engineering, civil and geotechnical uh, engineering companies founded by one of our alumni and, um, and they're a major employer of, uh, of our graduates as well as others. And uh, we were talking about the needs and the fact that they need more civil engineers trained, more geoengineers trained. We understand that. We are actually focused on that. Our civil environmental and geoengineering department has a number of initiatives that it, it has been working on to increasing the uh, visibility of the program and, and the profession, frankly, because one of the issues is it's not that the needs aren't there and that the industry isn't looking for these students. The question is, how do we pass this, these needs across the board to the students in high schools? Because frankly, not all of them, computer science clearly gets the press. So students all want to do computer science, or many, many of them want to do computer science, and we, we have to manage that load because the demand is there, frankly, as well. So that's included. But we also understand the needs for infrastructure and everything else that's so critical in areas like civil engineering, which uh, is actually a national concern. I just returned from a um, national meeting of the American Society of Engineer, uh, uh, Engineering, uh, ASEE, American Society of Engineering Education, Dean's meeting in Washington, and it is a concern because this, this drop in enrollments in areas like civil engineering are, are critical for the future of the country um, as we are talking about issues related to infrastructure and everything else. That's very critical. So we're very well aware of that. Our department is very well aware of it. It actually has implemented, we, we're offering scholarships to students who, who want to uh, study civil engineering at the freshman level through the department, in fact, uh, realizing those needs that cross all the uh, areas. So just to, to be, uh, make this very brief, if I may, um, we understand the needs, 
the needs across are pretty much across the board in all, all of our programs. The question is, as a community, all of us, this is one of the things that I was telling our alumni at this company that I was visiting, is that it is really up to them also as they work with school systems and everything to bring the excitement and the needs and the opportunities in the areas that they work in to the students so they take advantage of going and they think about these areas that you were talking about. But our, our expectations and, and our plans are to grow across the board, but especially uh, fill as much as we can in areas where we already have capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Regent McMillan, does that answer your question? Thoughtful and uh, comprehensive answer. I appreciate it. Uh, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. I intend to support the motion. I am uh, disappointed that we, um, you didn't um, uh, carve out um, or talk further about the the subset of international students. So that and I raised this at the at the at the um, uh, hearing that we discussed uh, uh, in January. Uh, I think it's a missed opportunity. The international students, in my view, you know, they're looking for value. They're looking for quality, and we're delivering it in this program. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily price sensitive, uh, unless you can tell me differently. And and looking at what Illinois and and some other schools are doing for international students, we're missing a year to sort of test out the elasticity of of charging even higher for those international students. And I, so I wish we would do that, but I will support the motion nevertheless. I would also say I, I like this tool. We should use it around the rest of the system where we can on a very strategic focused uh, basis, uh, both the Twin Cities and elsewhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Simonson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dean. Um, <clears throat> one of my concerns is every time we need, it seems like we, in my short time here, every time we need more revenue, we look for tuition rather than alternative sources. And, and that's something I'm going to meet with the Vice President of Research on. I think he's got some plans there. But when I look at this specific uh, uh, proposal, and I'm very supportive of the program and I understand the growth, I mean, and the need for this, this type of uh, major. But um, when I look at this, and I understand also the state support, as you said, has dropped 30%. But when we talk about uh, space constraints, deteriorating uh, facilities, et cetera, I thought that's what the state specials is all about. And, and I know we're uh, applying for state specials. And it just uh, bothers me that, again, it's always let's go to tuition and look at rather than alternative sources. So uh, uh, the other issue on Pell Grants, uh, I appreciate that, but that's really low-income students, uh, low-income families, as I understand it. So there's a whole lot of other people that would be uh, – and, and the other – Thing, the point is, what's the, what's the average debt? I know this last summer I had an intern that worked for me in the program. I paid him 12 bucks an hour. He lives very modestly, but he's going to get out of school with a lot of debt. Right. His parents are public school teachers. They had other siblings, and he's going to get out of school with a lot of debt. And so this bothers me that we just look at tuition. So, so I hear that. Sure. May I just make a comment? Uh, Vice President Tonneson, could, do you have an answer for like the first part, what state, state specials are for and everything? And I believe Regent Simonson, Regent Omari, in your agenda this afternoon, are we talking about debt and, and things, if I may? You read the docket. I read yes, the docket. Chair, so we <laughs> if, we, if that's okay, Regent Simonson, do you need that answer from these people or can we wait till this afternoon? I can wait until this afternoon. I made okay. my point. <laughs> yep, you made your point. So, so Ms. Tonneson, do you know the, uh, the deal about state specials you talked about for facilities and things? Uh, Chair Anderson, uh, Regents, the state special appropriations in law are very specific in terms of where the university has to allocate those funds when they come to the university. None of those, they're all recurring dollars, none of which are specific to facility needs. Um, they go to different programs. So our largest state specials actually go to the Experiment Station and Minnesota Extension. Um, CSE does have a couple of specials that total about a million dollars, but they're for program, not for facility purposes. And that would be true across all of the official state special appropriations. 
I don't know if that answers the question. Does that, uh, I'll take the, does that answer Regent Simonson? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, be Regent Rocha next, or wait, Regent Omari, I'm sorry. Thank Regent you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, generally speaking, I think this, this does make sense. Um, a few things that I would just uh, raise. One, as far as the international students, the international market is very uh, in flux right now uh, for a lot of reasons that are outside of our control. Um, and so I think it, it might make sense to, to look at that at some point. But right now, I would suggest that we do not play with uh, international students with a different surcharge because we don't know what the future is going to hold as far as uh, bringing in our, our international friends. Um, and then I have a, a more specific thought slash question. Um, as I look at this, it looks like we will charge the $1,000 for Pell eligible students and then give it back to them. Is that, is that right? Re uh, uh, Vice President Tonneson, do you Chair, have? Mr. Chair, Regional Mari, it would be in the form of a scholarship. So yes, they, they would be charged the same tuition rate and the surcharge, and then they would see a scholarship on their fee statement. So uh, I'm assured that some sort of accounting thing that we do that at the same time, and I'm getting practical again, um, if, if I'm a student who has $11,000 to pay, but I take out a $12,000 loan, and then end up getting a thousand dollars back in a scholarship. I'm not taking that thousand dollars and paying off that thousand dollars in my loan, which means that over four years I'll have an extra eight thousand dollars in loans uh, because I'm taking that thousand dollars. I'm doing something else with it. <laughs> so I don't know how much this accounting piece uh, is necessary, but it would make more sense to me to just not charge the student a thousand dollars instead of charging them and then giving it back to them. Or is that a prudent place to teach uh, financial literacy to students and say, if you got a thousand dollars back, you should be paying that back on your loan right away? Yes, and we're going to start a one credit class on that, right, Good. Mr. President? We've got it in Crookston. So, uh, Ms. Tonneson? Uh, uh, Re uh, Chair Anderson, Regent Omari, uh, hmm. generally speaking, we have been moving towards scholarships rather than waiving, which is what you're talking about when you say don't charge them in the first place, a, a group of students. So if you have a tuition rate and you want to sort of exempt some students from that tuition rate, we have been moving toward more scholarships rather than waiving because it represents a conscious decision to spend that money on that group of students for that purpose. If we waive it, what we have found is that people don't pay attention to how much we are foregoing in the revenue. And so over as we've developed more programs, that's, that's the, the route we have chosen to take. And also, if I may add, we also get information from admissions sometimes, just really quickly, that um, the students actually like to see a scholarship on their, their fee statement instead of having it buried and unknown. I like to say that, you know, sometimes I sit up here and, and the presenter's idea of briefly is not necessarily Sorry. my idea of briefly. But I'd just like to say that. Uh, <laughs> that was quick. Vice President Burnett, do you want to say something here before I get to Regent Rocha? And just to wow. add your Associate Vice President Tonneson's point, Regent Omari, uh, briefly, Mm -hmm. I, be, I believe we have to treat all students the same. Now, when we get at their financial aid packages, that's when we don't treat students all the same, but we, I don't think there's a possibility for us to not apply it to one group and another. We, need, we have to tr apply it across the board and work on packaging, so I don't think that that would be possible to exempt some from a new charge or any piece of what charges we do. Uh, and we can talk about that more offline. But I yeah, think we have to treat all students similarly, and it's in the financial aid packaging and their needs under the FAFSA and following federal rules about how we package financial aid that they start to see that maybe reduced in, in out-of-pocket costs. But you can't, I don't think we could legally sit here and decide you're going to apply it to this student and not that. I'm just putting that out there. Okay. Above my pay grade, we'll talk about it offline. Thanks. Thank you. We've got, uh, you know, we talked about this in January, and I've got five more speakers queued up in, in this, and some for a second time. So let's get through these five speakers, and then it's on the, the docket for a vote. We'll go there and, and see what happens. Uh, Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, tailing off of Regional Mari's topic, uh, I don't think things have changed that much since I was, was here, um, but when you talk about that, now you've got this loan that doesn't have to be used to pay your tuition because you're getting this scholarship. Um, you know, in my day that I had one classmate who um, came from a family that had a very heavily cash-based, expense-based business, there was certainly plenty of resource available to 
assist him to go to school, he still took out what he called his guaranteed snowmobile loans, uh, which uh, was the GSL as opposed to the guaranteed student loan, and that's because it was a very good interest rate, and he knew that he would be able to pay it off after after school, but yet he would qualify for all kinds of student aid because of the way his family's income was structured. I had other friends then who were tethered to their parents' income, uh, a parent or both parents' income, but they also had substantial family needs, whether it was multiple kids, health issues, other things, and so that person would not be eligible uh, to receive this scholarship, and, and therefore he or her uh, would be, uh, he or she would be compelled to uh, to, to cover that as additional debt and, and so on, and so we, you know, that, that I think illustrates that point. I, I find this conversation very frustrating for a number of reasons, um, not the least of which is that you know, I certainly wasn't part of a conversation before this was put in front of us in, in the last meeting. So to that extent, I'm kind of compelled to be you know, somewhat of a contrarian uh, if, if I'm not fully on board with the concept or if there are parts that I think need to be tweaked or if there are some conversations that I'd like to be a part of. So by the time it gets to, to the, the board, for those of us that haven't been part of those earlier conversations, you know, it's, it's a fully baked plan, here it is. Um, I appreciate uh, uh, Student Representative Kraft's comments. I, I thought you know, he was very gracious in, in sort of embracing what appears to be an inevitability. And so, you know, yeah, we don't like it, but if we're going to have it, let's make it, you know, do something to the good. I appreciate that. But I, I would say, first of all, you know, all, all campuses, all programs, I, I believe um, um, Dean Cave could, could come in and, and tell us about their dramatic needs. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm convinced of that. There, there would, I can't think of a single program that would not be able to come in and say, these are the things that we really need to be the best that we can be. Um, and, and, and I think you've made a very strong case. Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan of handling these tuition conversations in somewhat of a piecemeal fashion. We're going to be talking about tuition here coming up in an upcoming budget. Um, it's certainly been part of a conversation as it relates to our state request. And, and part of why I find this one particularly challenging, we, we talk about you know, where we are from a tuition standpoint compared to our peers or the fact that, that our peer institutions have these kinds of fees. Um, you know, there are certain things that you do that are different than others because you have a principled basis to not do them the same way. You know, I would suggest that our science and engineering students would be happy to pay the $1,000 per semester advantage if they were paying Madison's base tuition of 10000 versus Minnesota's of fourteen. And so when I look at this, and I, 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 not being able to have a comprehensive conversation about where we are from a tuition standpoint makes this really challenging for me because it's like, okay, so now we're at 15, you know, for these particular students. And, and what does that do to access? What does that do to a lot of these other concepts? Uh, even when we talk a little bit about, you know, it says CSE state support has fallen by 30%. I, I haven't really had a chance to dig in to sort of say, well, is that because the state at that percentage hasn't provided us that, that kind of support? Because to some extent, we as an institution decide where the state support goes, right? I mean, we have all this money. We can decide to give more to CSE, and now your state support number is, you know, goes up. I don't understand that because this isn't part of a broader conversation about tuition and how we provide these kinds of funds. I, I do think that, that this has an impact on students. Let's, let's face it, science and engineering is one of the top, we have one of the top science and engineering schools in the nation, in the world. We could charge a lot more, but that's not our only question here. The question isn't what can we charge, it's how do we strike that balance between access for the people that our state provides support to, uh, to educate, and, and um, you know, so I, I don't, when we talk about what people are going to make when they get out, when we talk about what we can command as in, in terms of tuition, I don't think that that's the proper framing of the, of the question for us specifically. And I don't think that we've had a chance to talk about that in a, in a comprehensive way with respect to tuition. And then the, the final comment that I'll make, um, and I made some comments last month as well, is, you know, I am, I'm concerned about... I want to make sure that we're clear about how we're going to support facilities with, the, with these dollars. You know, I tend to see facilities as really something that we take to the legislature, um, and they, they, you know, I mean, this is one of our, this is one of our strongest arguments, right? I mean, when you talk to state leadership, they want to make sure that engineering and science, that these are areas that were really, really successful. We can go make a very strong case for getting state support to, to fill that gap to make sure our facilities are where they are. Now, I recognize that we sometimes have a university portion, right? And maybe that's what this functions to, to, to support. 
but I just want to make sure that we don't send a signal to anybody that we have the ability to sort of, in an unfettered fashion, take as much as we want from students and fix the facilities ourselves because I'm sure the state can find many ways to, to, to provide capital bonding um, to other you know, dire needs across the entire state. Um, based on these concerns and based on the fact that I, I, I think that we really need to, to take a principled approach when we do these things, I'm not prepared to support this at this point in time. I understand the logic behind it, but I think there are a lot of questions about the way this is being facilitated and how it, how it fits within the overall tuition structure for the institution. And, and I think that the, uh, the danger of, of creating access problems, particularly for those who are not eligible for um, the abatement, um, I find that troubling and, and uh, I will not support it. Regent Rocha, thanks for your comments. Uh, Regent Spiegel. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, uh, Dean, uh, I think as I look at this and the information you've given us, uh, I think without question the market and the need demands are there to support this resolution, uh, without question. And it's probably too, Regent Rocha, that every school can probably make that argument. Uh, uh, so I, I plan to support the proposal, the resolution from that standpoint. But there is a part that bothers me. And, and that's uh, the part is that we, uh, we were, we're almost playing the federal and the state government and their role, I think. We, we're raising tuition, in this case a tuition surcharge, on everyone. And we're concentrating a few benefits, uh, no tuition surcharge, on Pell or on Promise students kind of a redistribution. And I'm not sure we should be doing that in tuition at all, much less a tuition surcharge. Um, you know, I understand the role of the federal government, you know, <laughs> gather all our dollars and redistribute them, some of the ag subsidies, some of the health care, some of the Pell Grants, whatever. And the state does the same. I'm just not sure that's our role in, in um, the University of Minnesota or at the board standpoint to, to do that. I would feel much more comfortable if we raise this uh, tuition charge, charge, surcharge, say at $750 per semester, per student, and not get into the redistribution, which we are doing right here. Because I, I just don't think that's our role. And uh, could I have a comment from you on that? I, I realize it's probably at a level here <laughs> rather than at your higher level. Uh, but, but still, I, I just really have a real core problem in redistributing that tuition income, um, and much less the surcharge tuition income. Dean Quay, do you have a brief uh, answer to that? Well, no, I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you, you ask a very good question, but that's, um, I, I would like to actually defer that to, to my colleagues at the central level. I've tried to defer <laughs> <laughs> I know. Julie, go ahead. I've, President I've, Kaler is, is willing to answer the question yes, for you. He'll, yes, he'll yes. phone thank a friend. You. Thank you. President Kaler? Chair yes. Anderson, uh, Regent Sviggum. Um, your question, of course, strikes at the heart of uh, the premise behind the Promise uh, program, which the board put in place many years ago as a way to provide uh, additional financial aid for low-income students. And so I think uh, at the end of the day, the debate should be the philosophical one leading to practical uh, board policies around what we as an institution feel is appropriate to do uh, to help uh, families uh, above uh, the Pell line. Uh, the promise now extends to uh, some level of help to families with up to $120,000 of, of annual income. So we're, we're tackling what is probably the naughtiest problem in financial aid and higher education in the U.S. today, which is the, the core middle class uh, families who aren't getting Pell help, aren't getting state grant help, uh, and don't make $250,000 a year to send their kids to school. We feel that this approach with the, the um, relief of the surcharge for students in that category is consistent with our existing board-approved philosophy around uh, the Promise program, and so that's why we're doing it this way. Mr. Chairman, if I heard you say, Mr. President, say students who aren't getting Pell help or aren't getting state grant help, but I think most of these students are getting those helps and additional the tuition and redistribution. Chair, Chair uh, Anderson, Regent Spigum, there is a uh, beautiful graphic uh, that, uh, that Vice Provost McMaster has made that shows the distribution uh, as Pell Grants, as, yes, as Pell Grants tail off as family income goes up, 
how the state grant feathers in, and then the Promise program. So the amount of money a student receives from each one of those grants depending depends and varies uh, upon family income, and we can show you that that graphic if you'd like to see it. I think it's good. I think we have a discussion coming up on that also. Is that in my agenda? Let me just say, I'm very uncomfortable with increasing a tuition surcharge, not just tuition, but to surcharge on top and, and redistributing it in our, in our uh, wisdom or yeah. in our... I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. I'm just saying I think we do have a, a full discussion coming up on Pell's and Minnesota Grant and Promise Scholarships. Any more, Regent Spigum? No. Regent Powell. Um, thank you, Chair Anderson and, uh, and Dean Kavay. Thanks for your remarks. So I um, I really appreciate the conversation. I appreciate uh, Regent Simonson's uh, comments. Typically, um, I'm very uneasy with uh, uh, tuition increases. Um, in this case, I'm, I'm going to support it. Uh, the reason is, um, first of all, as, as Regent Swiggum said, I, I think we're moving to a market practice and, and, um, uh, and um, for a program for which there is very, very strong demand. And so that is part of why I want to support this. But even more importantly uh, is the highly targeted nature of the benefits that are, gonna, that are gonna come from this, the opportunity to renovate labs and you know, the instructional spaces that uh, Dean uh, took us through. Uh, faculty retention, but most important for me is the fact that, you know, down the road we'll have another 400 engineering students on this campus. And so uh, I, I very much appreciate Regent Roche's comment on, on access, but, but access is there's, 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 there's cost, but there's also capacity. And, and right now we have limited capacity, and this opens up the door yes. for several hundred more students who would gladly come here if we had, and will gladly come here with the space. And so, and so, it, you know, this, this one, I think clearly, uh, you know, we have to accept that it is going to impose financial hardship. Uh, there's no doubt about that, um, and and that is is a worry. But on balance, uh, I think the benefits uh, outweigh those concerns for me, and so I'm going to support it. Thank you very much. Regent Thank you, Powell. Regent Paul. I'm going to ask Regent Shu and then Regent Simonson. You've asked to speak again. You'll take us. Okay. Regent Shu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, presenters. Um, I've been a proponent uh, of this concept since I joined the board four years ago and um, was kind of uh, briefed on how the Carlson School Program worked. I just want to make sure that I understand that the Carlson, that we are actually um, doing this exactly the same way as, as I think Ms. Tonneson had said earlier. Does that also include the question of um, how the, the Pell and um, other students are handled? He's Mr. nodding Mr. Chair, yeah. members, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, the, uh, I, I've been a proponent of calling these scholarships instead of waivers uh, because waivers, no one really knows, you know, that they're getting anything, and I think that by giving people scholarships um, it makes us more competitive um, when people start comparing uh, various offers. Uh, the other question I have is, is this something that, I mean, I assume it, because it's working for Carlson School, does our net price calculator um, calculate the proper amounts for these people as they're, as they're looking at our school? Vice President Tonneson. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, it makes it more difficult because it, it depends on which population you're talking to. So if we're talking about the university undergraduate experience in total, it generally will not include surcharges. It just includes basic tuition rates or differentials because in comparing across institutions, they don't have those differentials or they're at different levels for different programs. But if you're looking just at engineering, for example, and comparing against other engineering, yes, it would. But if you're looking at the full undergraduate population, we generally wouldn't include it. Uh, Would you shoot to answer your questions? Uh, kind of. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I am a little concerned about that, um, and I'm not sure if there's a fix for that. And, but I'm, I'm not sure also if it estimates high or low in terms of uh, some of these students who would actually end up receiving the scholarship. At the end uh, of the Mr. Day. Chair, Regent Chu, for a student, it definitely would include it. So if you're talking about calculating the net price per student, for a student, we would include it. I thought you were talking about the net price calculations we do in comparison in general across institutions. 
But if you're talking about a student or the students in that college, it definitely would include this as part of their tuition. Okay, thank you. And, and the thank scholarship. You. And then a follow up on um, uh, Regent Rocha's question about how the uh, additional revenues would be used to pay for things such as the chemistry building because we all know we need chemistry in order to help increase the um, capacity of, of the school and adding a hundred uh, students I think is admirable but I think you know we should be adding more than that and I'm not sure how chemistry the new chemistry building or the, the renovated chemistry building would play into that and how it would be paid for it. Answer there? Dean? Well the, uh, the chemistry um, laboratory on uh, building project that that that's we can talk about it right it, it, it is on on the university's uh, list of potentially coming up for a bonding request next year we hope it does thank you uh, obviously that's, uh, that's thank you Dean say. Regent Cohen. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I'm going to support the resolution. I'm very much in favor of it. But I do, I want to say that Regent Swiggum's comments really um, got my attention. And I do think that um, I'm very much for our promised scholarships, but I do think that it raises the question for the family that makes $125,000. Uh, they, they don't get that. And we are, in some ways, doing a redistribution of, of resources uh, when we use some of those scholarships. Uh, but I, I hope we can have a larger conversation about that this afternoon when we're talking about some of the tuition things. Regent Svigum, I'll give you the privilege. Did you want to add one, one more thing? Um, Mr. Chairman, just very quickly, I would not be fair to myself and uh, what I believe if I would not offer an amendment. Thank you for your words of support, uh, Regent Kaler. Mr. Chairman, just very quickly, okay. I'd like to move to amend the resolution on the therefore be it resolved, uh, first line of therefore be it resolved to delete 1,000 and insert 750. And in the therefore be resolved, the last sentence of the therefore, therefore be it resolved to delete. Mr. Chairman, I have to do that to be fair to myself, right? I'm even I understand what, what you're doing. I'm just trying to think it's probably best to ask for a second of that. You know? uh, I understand if it doesn't get a second, but one person will be hurt. Okay. Thank you, sir. Is there a second I to... I second the motion. It's been, set, it's been moved and seconded, so now we have an amendment on the table that uh, is going to ask for 750 per semester instead of 1,000. And Jason, would you tell me what are we striking? Striking the final sentence, which is students in both the College of Science and Engineering and the College of Liberal, Liberal Arts who are you promise or Pell eligible shall receive a scholarship or equivalent value to fully offset the surcharge. Do we have any idea, does anybody here, maybe Senior Vice President Burnett, have any idea what that takes the 12 million, 9 million down to? Mr. Chairman, I, I think we could. It takes it to nine million in gross because it's a twenty-five percent reduction. So we can do that math fairly quickly here. Um, but it would it would be a, a different policy question for certain. Um, striking the last sentence. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just to enhance what Vice President Burnett said, in the back of an envelope, that's the way it figures out. <laughs> the policy question, a different policy question. I've always said I'm not as bright as you guys. Nine million. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and to Regent Cohen's, um, I think, um, very collegial request for a, a, a conversation about the topic generally, th this is the cart horse problem for me. We haven't had the conversation about that concept. I mean, you know, obviously the board has spoken to it in the past. And, and in fact, during an earlier iteration of, of, of my service on this board is when the Promise Scholarship was first created, which was a, a, a bit of a challenge at the time because it was really supposed to focus on philanthropic giving, that it was supposed to be pay it forward, that people that had gone out and, and had successful careers and had resources were going to be funding scholarships. You weren't asking student A to fund student B sitting next to them under the, under the theory that we're generally going to get it right as to who actually has access to, to family resources. When we talk about family resources, there's this presumption that a student has access to income that other members of their family 
uh, generate. Nowhere else do we tax people on income that somebody else controls. This is the only time that we do it. We just make this, I think it's, you know, in, in, in the parlance of today's political discourse, I think it's offensive that we would, we would assume that all families operate the way our own families operate and that, and that everybody has access to their parents' income. Um, but I would also note that when you talk about the Promise Scholarship generally, we are not taking 25%. The, 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 we're, not, we're not taking this amount of money and then giving 25% for, no for no contribution from students that fall into the Byzantine um, mathematical formula for who has family need, right? In this one, it's 100%. You either pay 100% of it or you pay zero. That's not the way we do any of our other tuition. It's, I think roughly, Regent Spigum, I might be right, about 7%, about 7% of the total tuition that's generated by our, our, uh, from our undergraduate students across the board, um, it goes to a, some kind of a, a redistribution promise scholarship model. Well, if this was 7%, that'd be quite a bit different. So, I mean, if, it, you know, if everybody was paying, a, you know, if, if 1,000 was the base and then those that are Pell eligible are only paying 93, you know, $930, that would be consistent with what we said in the past that we're willing to accept as the inefficiency with our capacity to determine who actually has money from their families. But that's not what we're doing here. This is 100%. And I, I think that, it, you know, we certainly could come back and revisit it after having the comprehensive conversation, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's a mistake for us to adopt what, you know, this, this massive policy where you either pay 100% of it or you pay zero. And we really can't accurately say who actually has access to these funds from other sources. And uh, in, in, in this, going back to this graph that was described earlier that shows where this money comes in and where this tails off, we know with 100% who gets the money from the federal government. We know with 100% certainty who gets the money from the state. We don't know who gets money from home. But we make those assumptions. And I think that, you know, to, to, to those, to, to, the, to the, the young single mother who's trying to put herself through school who happens to be below the threshold that she's tied to her parents' income and her parents are not providing her income, this is really rough stuff, and I, I don't think that we should do it this way. And so I, I, I will support Regent Spigum's uh, proposal. If we then, after a, a more comprehensive conversation, come up with a perspective that is shared by the majority of the board that this is something we should be doing, uh, we certainly would have the ability to come back and revisit it and modify it at that point. Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair Anderson. I, I don't have it in front of me, but I noticed that other Big Ten schools, many of them do this, and many of them uh, have a higher surcharge. I think some of them had two thousand dollars, and huh. so I'm just curious how they manage the um, uh, rebates for um, affordability, or do we know that? I don't we know. don't know that, uh, Mr. We're, Chair, members. Okay. We I, we don't know that right now. I'm sorry. Because so I was surprised that surcharge. even with our thousand dollars, we're not pushing the top of the Big Ten. It's we're actually trailing behind. Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, looking at this third whereas, whereas the College of Science and Engineering is experiencing significant demand with exceptionally qualified students, uh, et cetera, um, what other sources of revenue have you considered other than tuition? Well, we, uh, as you know, we're in the um, um, midst, actually, uh, a, a very successful capital campaign. Um, so uh, a major part of the capital campaign in the, in the college is towards scholarships. And scholarships uh, are, are a big component of what, how we're going to help and attract our students. Um, but relatively a small amount um, generally comes towards uh, things like laboratories and, and um, facilities. We did have, a, I, I think I've spoken to this board in the past, um, a very successful case of a facility renovation through philanthropy, and that was the robotics lab that we opened a few months ago, and we're grateful for those opportunities. But, but typically, it does not happen on, on many of those. So that's um, now. Research, of course, is another component of how we run our program. The, um, and that, that's a big part of it, but th that's less relevant to the um, undergraduate instructional uh, resources that we can use. Th thank you, Dean Kavay. I think, I think we've, we've got a gist of what's going on. I'm going to ask for the vote on the amendment at this time. The amendment is uh, 
to reduce it to 750 per semester other than 1,000 and to uh, strike the language which redistributes the money, correct? So all those in favor of Regent Sviggum's mo uh, amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Do we need a show of hands? I think we need a show of hands. So at, the, at this point, I'm going to ask all those in favor of Regent Sviggum's amendment, please raise your hand. It's five. All those opposed? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, your hand is up, Randy. Six, seven. Peggy. Uh, motion is denied. Uh, amendments denied. So now we're back to the original question, the original uh, issue. And I'm just going to say, you know, I'm the last speaker here. I'm going to approve uh, and vote for this uh, surcharge. But there are things that, that trouble me. So uh, I'm somewhat troubled by a couple things. I'm, I'm troubled by when I look at the uh, our gold and maroon standards, we want to have a minimum of 65% Minnesota kids. And I think when I looked at your statistics, and you're one of our premier, you are a premier program here, we're, and that would say that we do get people from all over the world that comes to engineering, but we're at about 60% for Minnesota students, and I, I, I think I'd like to see you do better. Uh, we provide, you know, state money for Minnesota students. Um, what I call the Robin Hood issue, I've talked with uh, Regent Sviggum about. I think a better way to handle this redistribution is through philanthropy. I guess from my point of view, I'd like to see more philanthropy to handle uh, Pell eligible students rather than the redistribution portion. So with that said, I am going to call for the vote. Does anybody else have any final words before we vote? Okay. All those in favor of the uh, resolution for the $1,000 per semester surcharge signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion carries. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Um, we're on to the next item, which is um, capital budget amendment for East Cliff renovation and repair. I guess uh, Vice President Bertelson and Director Lindell King, Chair of the East Cliff Advisory Committee, are going to give us a very brief rundown, and then we're going to have a uh, hopefully a motion to make some improvements. Whenever you're ready, Vice President Burleson. Um Mr. Chair and Regents, um, um, Lindell King was unable to attend today, and she sends her apologies. Um, I would say that we are just, there are no changes to the project that have been uh, made since we presented to you um, last at, in the December meeting. This is still um, an improvements targeting between the uh, um, the presidencies, uh, residents at East Cliff. It's uh, focused on electrical and mechanical systems, and it's uh, with a budget not to exceed, and we are proceeding with the design and uh, looking forward to doing the work. Okay. Is there a motion to recommend approval of the amendment to the annual capital improvement budget for the East Cliff renovation and repair? So moved. So moved. Second. And is seconded. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any discussion on, on these items? Wow, great. I might catch up a few minutes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to ask for a vote if you're ready. All those in favor of uh, the amendment for East Cliff renovation and repair signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Wonderful job, Vice President Burleson. Um, now we'll ask uh, Associate Vice President Tonneson back up to what I call the witness table. <laughs> President Kale, did you want to comment? I'm sorry, I didn't catch you. No, on, the, on this. Oh, on this one. Okay, okay. So you're going to lead off the discussion on this instead of Vice President Tonneson. Okay. Whenever you're ready, President Kaler. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Mr. Chair, members of the board, this morning we are bringing forward a discussion of the university's fiscal year 2020 annual operating budget framework. Uh, I will note that this is a, a step uh, over several, several, several years of evolution as we attempt to bring the board into the budget a discussion earlier and earlier so that you don't feel that we're giving you a baked meal and you have plenty of opportunity uh, to provide uh, comment and input. We do reflect uh, as the state's land grant university that our mission requires our efforts in teaching, learning, research, discovery, outreach, and public service meet the changing needs of Minnesota and Min Minnesotans. The budget framework that uh, we will share with you today is pragmatic and strategically focuses the university to deliver benefits to our constituencies. And it 
I'll add that we kept our pledge to reduce administrative costs and covered many cost increases through budget cuts and reallocations totaling $91 million in six years. We're mindful of, of opportunities to continue reducing those costs. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to hand things over to Julie Tonneson, Associate Vice President and Budget Director. Thank you. Associate Vice President Tonneson, whenever you're ready. Mr. Chair, I hope you don't say I do a bad job if I take more than the 30 seconds that Mike took. <laughs> oh, no. that, was, that was very quick. Mike cut us back on time. Okay, okay, excellent. Thank you, Mike. Um, so what I want to do here today is very briefly, I, I'm hoping within 15 minutes, uh, run us through three different things. I want to just remind us all what the budget framework is. Uh, take a few minutes to talk about revenue and expenditure variables, decisions around those that we have to make uh, within the budget framework, and then finally to talk about some balancing examples that perhaps provide different ways to approach our options, things for you to consider as you provide input on the budget. So just starting quickly with the budget framework, this is, as you recall, a very high level, kind of 30,000 foot look at our incremental revenue and expenditure changes, primarily in the O&M and tuition funds. Why do we focus on those funds is because they are the single largest source of unrestricted revenue we have that we can use to solve problems across the institution and also to invest in our priorities uh, so they are not restricted to any particular purpose. So they're very important. The other funds of the institution, so the gift income, the royalty income, the sales, the fees, and so forth, those are included in the budget. As you know, we submit them to you as part of the President's recommended operating budget, which will come in June. We monitor them, we manage them. The expectation on those funds is that they actually grow every year to cover the cost increases for the activities that those funds are supporting. And we'll talk more about that, but that is an expectation. That means that when we're looking at balancing the framework, we actually have to, significant decisions to make really around O&M and tuition and not those other funds as much. So we focus our decisions around that roughly 41% of our budget, 1.6 billion of the 3.8 billion. And I'll talk more about the decisions we have to make and lay those out for you uh, in a minute. But before I do that, I wanted to share with you the, the format really that we will be talking about the value of the variables. So we'll use this format. As we move forward in the process, we have to identify our goals around our, those main unrestricted resources. So for tuition, for the state appropriation, and for internal reallocation. Simultaneously, we have to understand the costs that we face, particularly related to compensation as our largest expense in any given year, but also for things beyond that that, is, that are necessary where we have cost increases just in continuing our current level of operations, and then things where we want to enhance or strengthen our program and activities. So on the, on the resource side, if we look at the questions we have to answer at this point in the process, we have to ask ourselves, what do we want to plan for a change in our state appropriation? Do we plan for the full 100% that we requested or something different? What do we want to plan for a change in tuition rates across all the different categories and campuses? What do we want to plan for a targeted reallocation to each of our units, academic and support? What do we want to plan for growth in those other resources to the extent that they can help offset O&M and tuition costs after covering their own cost increases. The primary questions on the spending side at this point are planning for compensation. So what do we want to plan for a percentage increase in the general merit pool for salaries? And beyond that, what do we want to plan for, what do we know about our must-do costs, particularly related to facilities, technology, and some compliance area, areas? And then for the layer of investment beyond that, what size of investment pool do we want to build into the budget? If we answer these basic questions, we have the skeleton of a budget. And we can then work with each of our units to understand how they fit into, uniquely fit into that skeleton and that structure as we go through the process. So first, what are the questions on the resource side? As I mentioned, O&M and tuition combined is roughly 41% of our budget. And that, along with internal reallocations, is the basis for the decisions that we have to make. The light green, the red, and the yellow slices of this pie represent those other resources that may be able to help us on the margin, but they play a smaller role uh, in, in the balancing part of the exercise at this level. 
Focusing on the, the main framework resources then, we need to decide what to assume for our state appropriation increase. As you know, we requested a $30 million increase in FY20 in our appropriation, kind of phase one, and then an additional $27 million in, in phase two in, in FY21. The question right now before us is what do we want to build our assumption on in the FY20 budget? 100%, that full 30 million that we're going to get or something less than that? As we described in the September and October, when you approved our request, we laid out a very early version of a budget framework, which we can now be in the position to refine on the expense side and the revenue side. But last summer, when we built this, uh, we built our cost estimates based on information we had available at the time, as well as some trend data. So we looked at a $40 million increase for uh, compensation, assuming a 2.5% salary pool. We looked at trend that showed we could spend about $6 million increased on facilities and technology. And we put in what we thought was a reasonable amount for investment pool items. So for FY20 alone, we had an a $67 million net increase in expenses. Our plan to pay for that, as we described at the time, included the $30 million of state appropriation. That would cover 45% of what we, what we viewed our costs as. And the remaining 55% we described as coming from a combination of internal university reallocations, other revenues if possible, and tuition increases. So now in our refining process, we have to look at tuition and what the options are there. The primary goals we have set for tuition in recent years are, are summarized here. On the Twin Cities campus for the resident undergraduate rate, we have attempted to keep that at an inflationary rate or slightly less, and we have achieved that over the last six years. For the non-resident non-reciprocity rate on the Twin Cities campus, you, are, you know that the strategy has been different, and in <laughs> fact, you have made the decision already for FY20 in that we have a, you have approved in December an increase of 10% for incoming students and the planned 5.5% for continuing students. On the, uh, for competitive reasons, uh, for the greater Minnesota campuses, we, act, we have actually tried to achieve a flat tuition rate there over the last several years. Um, and we have achieved that primarily with the greatest increase in any of the last six years being one and a half percent. And in most years, it has been zero. On the graduate and professional side, again, our goal has been to remain around inflation with variations by school and by program in those rate increases driven by market considerations, debt loads for students, program rankings, and so forth. So the question here is, what should we plan for each of these rate categories? And finally, on the resource side, we need to answer questions about reallocation plans. We have traditionally included reallocations in our budget balancing as long as I've been here, 25 years. We maybe had a year or two where we did not incorporate a reallocation and the <coughs> units you know, jump for joy, but generally speaking, we do. Prior to FY14, they, those ranged anywhere from 0.5% to 3%. That higher end of the range were in years where we were cut in our state appropriation. So we not only had to cover cost increases, but we had to offset a loss of revenue in those years. So that forced it to a higher percent. We're just coming out now out of a six-year time span where we did implement the president's goal to reallocate $90 million over six years. As he mentioned, we think we're going to hit 91 and a half, roughly, um, by the time we are done. And each of those years, we have shared with you the specifics on how we have done that. We have provided lists of the individual decisions that the units have made uh, that added up to anywhere from $11 million to $20 million a year in administrative reallocations. And I, I must mention on top of that, we have made mission-related reallocations as well along the way to balance the budget where they made sense to do so. Moving beyond the $90 million now, we will continue to reallocate to balance the budget. We, have, we are past the $90 million program, but we count on this as a part, a necessary part of balancing our budget. We expect our managers to find efficiencies every year, to work smarter, to implement best practices, and that will continue. The question we face each year, and now for FY20, is how much do we want to force into the system? Anything up to about 1% generally means that we can absorb most of that through efficiencies with limited or minor impact on operations, depending on the unit and, and what 
and what they are prepared to implement. But as we go above that 1%, we start worrying about and having to think about the greater impact on our program scope in some cases and on quality. Moving to the spending side of the equation. So we often talk about cost changes in two kind of familiar buckets. The first being what do we face just to maintain our core operations. We know now that even without a salary increase for FY20, we will have a fringe benefit cost increase in the framework funds of $13.2 million. And in the non-framework funds, all those other funds, it's another $10 million on top of that. We, we now need to decide on top of that fringe cost, what do we want to build in for a salary pool increase? For each 1% in the framework funds, it will cost us 12.3 million on top of the 13.2. And in the other funds, that's an additional $11 million. So just to make the point again, that's a cost that we are expecting those other revenues to pick up by growth, <laughs> just the natural growth in those other revenues. The first claim on that growth is the compensation cost, the fringe and potentially the, the salary increase pool, um, if that applies. In addition, at this point, we have more refined estimates on our facility and technology costs where we really have no choice. So the things we have to do, primarily utilities, is the largest piece of this. Um, and we view that as a, a cost increase right now of roughly $3.5 million. In the other areas of our core operation, we have choice in how far up or down, however you want to think about it, the priority list we feel we need to go on items. Determining those absolute priorities through meeting with the units and understanding what they're facing. We think that will be at least $7 million, but we're not actually through that process yet. And then the second bucket of spending centers around expanding or enhancing programs and services. There is never a shortage of wonderful ideas and proposals to make headway on our strategic plans. We get many, many good ideas. So here the budget is really bound by a decision on how much we want to include for new investment as an investment pool in the budget. Based on past experience, we think a 10 to $20 million range is sufficient to, to be able to take advantage of opportunities and to allow us to address uh, some of the most important uh, priorities. Now, pulling it all together for some modeling. Uh, so in that same format that I introduced earlier, here you see some more specifics on the numbers and the range of options we have. Uh, we provided for tuition in a little bit more detail the different uh, categories of general tuition rates and what each percent that just chose some percents here to provide uh, for context. The state appropriation, again, at the 30, 30 million, and we can obviously scale that down if, if necessary. And then the internal reallocations, what each percent or half a percent would raise um, in, that, in that bucket. At the same time, we've identified on the cost side similarly what values are related to different salary pool increases. That's in addition to the fringe alone of 13.2. And for the other costs, the minimum column you see there really represents what we anticipate to be the must-dos, but the choice lies in how much above that do we want to go to, into basic operations but also into program-type investments. We have choices as we move above the minimum. This is an iterative process back and forth, so I wanted to share with you two uh, balanced frameworks. These are just examples to offer some range of thought of how this actually can work. So let me walk you through it just briefly. In the first column of numbers on the left, I've condensed the tuition into three lines here. Uh, for example, we have a 2.5% increase in the resident undergraduate rate a 3% increase in the graduate and professional, and you see in the gray bar the decision that has already been made on the non-resident, non-reciprocity, so that one is already done. But we also presented in that first column an assumption of 100% of our state appropriation request and a half a percent on reallocation. Those combined resources would generate an estimated $68.1 million, and with that, we could pay for the fringe, again in gray, because there's no choice there, and it would allow us to implement a 2.5% salary increase for the general salary pool and kind of a mid-range goal on all of the other cost categories. That would leave us with $100,000 on the bottom line, so that's balanced. Now, if you look at that, however, and you decide that Perhaps those revenue assumptions are too high. 
Moving them down, we are left with a few options for making up that lost revenue, but they have consequences. Obviously, each decision does. So in the second example, I move the tuition rates down to 1%. I move the state appropriation uh, assumption down to two-thirds of our request. And losing that revenue, we have three choices in how to make it up. We can increase the internal reallocations, which I've done here, moving from 0.5 to 0.75%. The risk there, as I mentioned earlier, is in losing some quality and some uh, perhaps scope in areas as we move up the, the cut um, continuum. We can also spend less on compensation. So this example moves it from 25 to 2%. And here are the consequences. We need to decide the impact of that on being able to recruit and retain our most valuable resource, our people. And we could, and or we could decide to spend less on all the other investments. And here we moved from mid-range down to kind of that minimum must-do level. And here the risks are there's a potential of a negative impact on our ability to maintain or increase quality, certainly. And at some level we risk creating situations of non-compliance or financial instability. The art of this budget is iterative, moving back and forth on these types of decisions uh, until we have a correct balance that reflects our priorities. It reflects um, the need to make each unit as successful as we possibly can, given the constrained resources we have, and yet we have to balance the numbers in the end. So it is a back and forth process. Uh, we, that is all I have, Mr. Chair, and we invite your thoughts and your input uh, as we think about the FY20 budget and these, these decisions we have to make. Thank you, and, I, and I, uh, I really appreciate the possible scenario slide because it lets us look at where we have the, the ability to go up and down and things, so I appreciate that. Um, chair McMillan? Well, you're chair. I'm not. Well, read <laughs> Chair McMillan. Yes, uh, thank you, Sub -chair. chair Anderson, and uh, I, I just want to make a uh, a complimentary comment, but in the compliment, I want my colleagues to also appreciate that we have all the pieces of the puzzle here today, and it is February, early February, and over time, several members of this board have pushed to, and the administration has responded, and what you see today is all of the elements of this puzzle before us with the ability now three and four months ahead to talk about it and to have a dialogue, a meaningful dialogue with the moving parts and pu of the puzzle before us. So that has been an, a, a progressive process over time. When I first got here in 2011 and 2012, it was, you didn't see this until mid-May. And it's really tough to deal with at that point, tough for us, tough for the administration. So I know how hard it is, but thank you. Vice President Tonneson, thank you, President Kaler, thank you, Senior Vice President Burnett, um, for getting us all of this. Personally, I'd like to see us not piecemeal any of it. We've piecemealed the NRNR, you know, item, and I know why, and I don't have a big bone to pick with that, but I like it when we get to this point and we can now sit here and have a really good adult conversation about all the challenges that lie before us and how we make it up, and I have never before seen this kind of, you know, um, choose this, here's the consequences, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, I appreciate that. Student Representative Pathoulis, you have a question or a comment? Thank you, Sheriff. So based on a really slide 59, so I understand that outside sources of new dollars are either going to be essentially students or the state. And I get that we have to, you know, either increase tuition or ask for more state appropriation to, you know, have competitive compensation for our faculty to meet mission objectives, things like that. But really, in, so in my mind, when I look at new dollars, it's either a dollar from the state or a dollar from students. And I would, I would urge this board to uh, continue to and, and really think about pursuing those state appropriations as aggressively as you've raised tuition on students. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And, I, and I'm just going to point out that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, you know, one of the things I've found from chairing this committee is the importance of the reallocations. I, I don't know if everybody, you know, every one of the 51 budget units is given a number by President Kaler to say, you've got to do without this much next year. So that is loped off. 
put back on the top as basically new revenue. And so every year, the each unit is going right to the individual units and loping off what they believe they can live without, is it, whether that's facility, facilities or staff. I mean, this year, one of those decisions, I think, was in CEHD, would it have been the um, child care? And so they have to look and say, is it what we can look? And so I came to, you know, we're not saving the total budget dollars, but we're reallocating them to the top. And I know two things that have been kind of, that I fought for that we funded through that is the land grant legacy scholarships for rural students. And I believe the, uh, we are able to put some more mental health professionals in staff by reallocating. So there is an extra one. I just wanted to point that out. Do you want to say something about that? And if I could, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, to our student representative. If you look at the numbers, we asked the state for a 4.6% increase on the base of our unrestricted appropriation. We're not modeling any tuition at anywhere near 4% for residents of, this, of the state of Minnesota. So for your, to your point, we are pressing the state legislature to think about an investment that would be higher proportionately compared to what our students would be asked to balance the budget. Regent Paul. Um, thanks, Chair Anderson. Um, first, I just want to echo Regent McMillan's. Uh, uh, comments. Uh, I think that the way that you've laid this out and with the focus on the really primary drivers and, uh, you know, toggling those back and forth, it really promotes the right kind of discussion by the board and keeps us um, on strategic issues. And, and I, I think it's really helpful and I'd like to thank you for it. Um, in the, in the, um, the reading material, there was a comment on um, sort of, I think it said two priorities, two, two budget priorities. One was uh, maintaining the core, um, and the second point was investment in strategic goals. And so I guess uh, th th what I'd like to offer is, I mean, I, I, have, a, I have a different view of, of the priorities. I think there are three. For me, number one, as you said, is to maintain the core, and, and that is about um, the investment in um, our faculty and the people here that are this institution and what does it take to be able to continue to attract and retain and that really is the core. This is a people place. We've got to stay competitive on that. And so I agree with that. I would add, I, I would add a second one uh, to, to your list. For me, the second priority is to hold the line on tuition. And so, I mean, this is me uh, uh, making an argument, but so for me, um, maintaining the right level of investment uh, in the faculty and the administration, the people who run the place, is really primary. We have to do that. I'm not sure whether it's 2.5% or 2%. We can talk about that. The second thing is, is that we should be doing everything we can to minimize tuition increases. Again, it's my view, a priority. And then the third thing is I want to invest in strategic initiatives as well, but I think we do those after we do the first two. And um, and I guess looking at the numbers, you know, there were a lot of numbers, but if we, if you agree with those, you know, you can, you can get to um, a 2% increase or 25 and uh, on, on salaries, no more than 1% on, on tuition. And, and probably with this, with, if we get the full state and um, the 1% um, reallocation, which I think you said is the, the annual target, uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Powell, it, we haven't set the target yet. That's one of the decisions we have to make. But that one percent has been about where we've been. Yeah. So anyway, I, I didn't I didn't do all the math, but it feels like we would be able to achieve um, priority one and priority two with that sort of basket of goods. And then you get to the new initiatives, and you have a conversation on what should they be and where do we find the funding for them. But those become sort of the third part of the discussion. Anyway, that's a comment for consideration by my colleagues. I think that's terrific. I think there's several ways we can get there, and it's the 12 of us that drive that priority. Um, Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd certainly echo the comments by the Chair and Vice Chair around this uh, early and continuous look at the budget. It's very <laughs> different than what I was, saw when I joined the board uh, 10 years ago. Um, my comments on I think we should be modeling for what we have asked. Uh, hopefully, we'll get additional dollars. There is a surplus 
And I think the board needs to be more aggressive in advocating for a fair share. We have been defunded as an industry. And we've been underfunded as an institution. However you want to explain it, the fact is, look at the numbers are the numbers, and we have not gotten the dollars that we have needed. And our spending rate, this is what Regent, former uh, Regent Broad used to say, our spend rate is lower than any other unit of government, much lower than the states. And our tuition averages have been very modest, 1%. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you, you show me one business that's able to keep prices the same year after year, it doesn't exist. And so looking at a modest tuition increase should be, should be acceptable. Now, on the other hand, uh, as it relates to reallocations, we don't have a plan for operational uh, excellence. We, there, we have no post plan. We haven't used this year to set up a plan for how we deal with costs. And we, everybody's got ideas. People got opinions about that. We're going to have to do some realloc. You, you mentioned here, reallocation has to continue. That's a forever process, and you need to put a dollar amount in there, probably. But this board needs to really look at the cost side with the uh, with the new president coming uh, coming forward. On the compensation side, we may have to look at two percent versus two and a half percent, or something in between. I mean, I, you know, that's what is the cost of inflation? We've had that conversation, uh, but there's still going to be pressure, unfortunately, on wage. Uh, on wage uh, uh, wage increases. So um, thanks and thanks again for getting in the chair, the vice chair, for getting this conversation going earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Uh, Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair. I uh, I too appreciate this uh, overview uh, very much. It makes things a lot more transparent. Um, and I'm actually for expanding and enhancing programs where we can. Just a couple of questions with regard to that. Um, we talk about reallocation. When we talked about the College of Science and Engineering a little while ago and, and their needs, uh, I look at that as a, uh, from a business standpoint, a good return on investment. You got a big demand there. And, and uh, so on this reallocation, how do, why don't we look at that and moving that faster, number one. And, and then number two, when I look at uh, uh, what you've presented here and you're looking at uh, assumed, uh, where did it go here, yeah, resources, uh, state appropriations, tuition, and internal reallocations. Mm -hmm. Seems to me there's other things we can look at, a lot of other things. Why don't we? Associate Vice President Tonneson, do you have answers? Um, sure. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Simonson, first on the reallocation for College of Science and Engineering, they absolutely will be reallocating, just as every other unit will. When you're looking at a 1% reallocation on a unit of that size, you are looking in over a million dollars, closer to $2 million of reallocation that they will would have to come up with as part of just balancing the budget in paying for compensation increases, in paying for all their overhead increases, and so forth. Excuse me, so forth. So they absolutely are part of that process. Um, now, moving into the other revenues, as I've tried to point out, the first, we are raising other revenues, and we absolutely expect all of those other revenues to grow. They have to, because their costs grow. So if you're, if you're using, let's say you are using, um, let's say you're using royalty income or, no, let's, let, let's say you're using endowment earnings to pay for a, a faculty member's salary or sales income, clinical income, to pay for a faculty member's salary. In order to pay the raise for that person, we don't use our o and tuition funds to pay the raise for that person. They have to grow the revenue to pay that. So the first call on that on those fund growth is actually the fringe increase that I mentioned, which they will have to pay, and any salary increases that we provide. So they have to grow for that, let alone the inflation on the equipment and the supplies and everything else that those funds are supporting. So don't, so don't think that we aren't thinking about those revenues. We absolutely are, and we are depending on growth in those revenues. And in fact, if they don't grow, those, those opportunities, that, they have to reallocate on those funds as well. So if we don't, you know, let's say that we raise um, housing rates, something, I'm making this up, if you raise housing rates at a lower level than the costs are going up, 
they have to reallocate to help pay for, they have to cut things in order to pay for that cost growth. So there, there are demands on all of those other activities that we manage annually as well. Once in a while, and we look for these opportunities where those revenues grow beyond the cost obligations they have, and then we use them to offset the O&M and tuition costs. So most often that's going to be things like um, ICR, indirect cost recovery revenue that we get on top of our grants, the overhead money. If that's growing and the unit hasn't committed that, all of it, to increase costs for those activities it was paying for, they say to us, let's move some of these O&M and tuition costs over onto that ICR revenue source. And every year, units bring a little bit of that in, but my point in this exercise is that it is on the margin. It's relatively small compared to the reallocation that we require, the O&M increase, and the tuition. But you will see in the budget we bring you, you will see that growth in those other revenues to cover their own costs and then to help support the O&M and tuition budget. Okay. Uh, Terry, uh, yeah. um, I guess I would like to see that noted on here as part of a strategic plan. And how we, I know they're relatively small. I think they're mm -hmm. too small. And I think if we, if we had a strategic plan on how we're going to grow those mm -hmm. and we monitored that uh, over time, I think it would help with the legislature. They said how we're going to do this, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 I, I'm I'm very interested in why that's not included here. We talk about again tuition and state appropriations, and and I think we can do a lot better in our relationship with the legislature if we show them how we're trying to grow revenues other than those two ways. Thank you. That's a good point. Good point. Uh, Regent Johnson, you've been quiet all day. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, members. Um, I'm going to sound a little bit like the Grinch of February here, but I, just for discussion purposes on uh, this budget process, uh, being involved in a couple other organizations and we deal with budgets, the first thing we do is talk about cost containment. Are there things in spending that's, that's being done? And I'm not suggesting for a moment that that's occurring here at the university. Um, but in most organizations, 35 to 40 percent of costs associated with benefits, health, pension, so on and so forth. So my question, Ms. Thomason, Thomason is, and you've done an excellent job, are there, and you know, this can send shrills to the university community, I understand that, but we have a responsibility to balance a budget. Are there benefits that we provide as a university that we need to look at in a competitive way? Now, Regent Swigum, you have talked about comparisons to the state of Minnesota. And if we make comparisons with Hennepin County, Ramsey County, City of Minneapolis, maybe it's an unfair comparison because our mission is certainly different than, than theirs. Uh, but perhaps a better way of looking at it are our uh, costs as it relates to other Big Ten uh, universities. So I'm just getting at are there potential ways of cost containment and renegotiations, you know, with, with employees. Now, no one ever wants to talk about that because it's the elephant in the room. I have those benefits. We all enjoy benefits at some level from some organization. And to suggest that benefits or more participation, uh, it's very dicey, I understand. But as opposed to talking about tuition increases and other revenue increases, uh, I think it's worth talking about, and legislators do ask about that. So you may want to comment, or we may have discussion off, uh, offline, but I think it's worth considering uh, in the whole benefit package. President Kaler, I think, wants to answer. Uh, but, uh, thank you, Chair Anderson. Let me address that first. Uh, Regent, An uh, Regent Johnson, uh, your... Uh, uh, previewing uh, the next presentation uh, on uh, annual workforce and total compensation. So Vice President Brown will uh, talk about some of these these issues. Uh, I'll just frame uh, briefly, if I may, Mr. Chair, 61% um, of our spend is on people. And so your question about compensation and benefits is, is spot on. Um, there are other elements of our cost structure that we really can't do very much about. We, we, we you know, we need to, we need to heat the buildings and we need to, to deal with our physical plant. 
Uh, and we have a, a spend on uh, external outreach and on research, which we feel is for delivery of our land grant mission. So um, those are the, the big picture items, and they're, they're relatively fixed. They need to be looked at very carefully and continuously, and, and I believe we, we do. Uh, but the, the workforce compensation and benefits issue will, uh, will be teed up uh, straight away. Okay, thank you. That answered the question, Regent Johnson? Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think of the same thing. I look at the benefits, and it's $13.2 just what the increase is. And, you know, I, I know with our partnership with Fairview, we have a preferred one. We have our ownership and preferred one health insurance. Maybe there's ways we can look at different things. But these are these are long-range, big-picture things. Uh, Vice, Senior Vice President Burnett. Just on that point, we we had a refund several years ago on, on a pharmaceutical um, settlement that we had to put back into our benefits that artificially lowered our benefits. So really, we haven't really changed the cost structure much. We've just now run out of that refund in our benefit pool, which is the primary reason that's going up, and a little bit on the medical side, because medical expenses are going up. But just for, we haven't changed the benefits, but we've had to run out that refund that we had years ago. And under federal law, we had to credit that back to our fringe rate and work through it. Um, to comply with all the rules we have around federal research and that type of thing. I think one thing that might be helpful to all of us here who, who look at that from a business standpoint, <laughs> what is our benefit per employee, you know, the, the dollar amount per employee or something, so we can see where does that fit with the private sector and I own a small business, where does it fit with what I was providing my employees. Uh, with that being said, Regent Rocha, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a good conversation. Um, First, I want to touch on a point that Regent Beeson made um, in, uh, in re reference to uh, Regent Broad's previous comments about the spend rate. I, that's, uh, that's accurate. And certainly, when you look at the growth in state government spending, you know, we clearly are not keeping that pace because it's gone up dramatically in the last, uh, last decade. But I would point out that when you look at the university's um, <clears throat> structure, our budget, we're riding what was a dramatic increase in the base um, on tuition? You know, when you you know prior to um, essentially anybody on the board right now, uh, you had you had a, you know, sort of this uh, exponential growth in tuition. I mean, right now tuition, if you were were to have kept track off over the last twenty five years following inflation, it would be about half of what it is. So that funding is such a huge part of how we've been able to continue to grow the size of the budget, even though the state hasn't necessarily kept pace. Um, even on an inflationary basis. Um, I want to you know, also talk about the fact that this is, a, this is a terrific opportunity. I guess I'm number four in echoing somebody, you know, the, the, the chair's original comments about how great this is. I, I would, um, it, you know, I've got to say that it, it is really helpful, very, very helpful to have this conversation this way. Um, you know, uh, but there's also the challenge. We've had a couple of folks that have, you know, Regent Powell used the term strategic, and, and uh, Regent Simonson uh, uh, said, you know, re a reference to strategic plan. This is, this is again, my challenge, because at this point, this becomes some, as we move into this process, it's its own, its own strategic plan, because there's not a longer plan to sort of compare it to to see whether we're hitting the right azimuth um, as we go forward. Um, but there are, some, there are some things, I think, that are really informative. And to, to engage the discussion right now, when we talk about compensation, and, and President Kaler uh, aptly pointed out that we're moving into that, uh, the next agenda item, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I really, you know, I, I want to see more from that, that conversation because I don't know that you necessarily serve the institution the best we can by just throwing out a general pool number. I think that you, you know, we could have a 1% total compensation increase or a 6% total compensation increase, but you know, hypothetically at the 1% level, we could look and see there are critical areas of employees, certainly your lab workers that are you know, at $9 an hour or $10 an hour, those may be 15% increases, whereas we have other categories where we are very well positioned um, that maybe it's a little bit more, um, more modest. And so I, I think that when the, the, the broader you create those categories, the more difficult it is to find where we can be efficient and where we actually have true need versus just simply, you know, the easy, uh, the easier approach of just generalizing that way. Um, but I would actually, I would actually push us even, you know, now into the next, the next level with respect to this conversation. 
This is super helpful as we go into our budget cycle. This would be even more helpful if we could move it earlier because we're in a budget cycle. We're in a, we're in a state budget cycle. And the more clarity I believe, and those of you that are talking to lots of legislators, and I know there are members of the, of the board that are having many conversations right now, you, you probably find that there is an appetite among legislators to know where we're going, what we're going to be doing with these resources. And so having, in, in a budget cycle year, if we can be even, you know, pull it back a couple months even perhaps to, to be able to um, get clarity on where we stand. And, and why do I bring that up? Well, as, as we have our 80, uh, seven million dollar uh, request out there um, it, it seems to be fairly well received but there still is this is this is my experience um, there still is a reservation we're talking about because we, we have put out a number of, of, a, of an, uh, an anticipated tuition increase and many legislators respond to that as as being somewhat of a threat you know you either give us the money or the kids are going to get it and, and in this case we're not even saying that we're saying the kids are going to get it whether you give us the money or not and and, and so um, from my perspective, this is a very bipartisan message in my experience, is that um, the, the state is looking to the university to maintain accessibility and hold the line on tuition independent of what the state's able to do. Um, they, don't, they, they don't want us to, to sort of create the, you know, put, put the, the problem in their lap and say this is your, your fault, you know, that we have things that we can do and if we truly have a commitment to keeping tuition under control, as Representative Petula stated earlier, um, with the same, you know, th then we can pursue those those resources. My my preference would be in a situation like this, and I've spoken with the chair about this, is that we would we would actually declare that we do not perceive an increase in resident tuition as a source of additional revenue uh, in this cycle, and make that commitment to the legislature. And here's here's the upside. If you, if you are able to exceed the 87, and we know right now we are in a very precarious position where Minnesota State, the other major system that receives state money, has asked for substantially more. And if you go to the historic 60% of what everybody's asked for, they're gonna be getting a lot of money and we're gonna be getting 60% you know, of what we've asked. We'll see what happens, and I'm, and I'm, I'm optimistic that we can make the case that, that, that they've asked for some more wants and ours are, are exclusively needs, but that, that's gonna be a tough, sell it's going to change the way the legislature's worked in the past if we tell them that anything above the 87 will be targeted toward perhaps reducing tuition on our system campuses which are not particularly competitively uh, funded right now uh, compared to, to their competitive marketplace I think you give the legislature an incentive um, to not only meet as you know the needs that we've that we've uh, made a request about but also it gets those legislators from those areas that, that have a, a specific interest in our system campuses to, to get behind our overall request. And so uh, the, the point, you know, that, that tails off the point that the earlier we can have this conversation, the more strategic we can be about that relationship with the legislature uh, to try to reverse this trend that's been going on now for several years where we are not being funded as much as our, our, uh, uh, our, our dear friends in the Minnesota state system. So that, that's my, my input for this at this point. I don't really know exactly you know, what, what to action out of that, but I, I, I wanna congratulate you on giving us a, a, a real nice understanding. And then as we go forward to this conversation, I think it's gonna be a much better informed conversation than we would have had without your uh, substantial work. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Roche. I think you, you gave some really good guidance there for us to think about too. Um, just so you know, we're not voting on this today. We've got about 10 minutes left for this. And uh, I've got four regents to speak. And I'm going to ask you to be fairly brief. It can be your brief, not my brief. But uh, Regent Lucas is next. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I'd like to compliment Vice Pres Associate Vice President Tonneson. I think you're a world-class explainer. And this has been really, uh, really, really helpful. <clears throat> there are two pieces of information that I could, that would help me do my internal math on all of this. One is, what is the inflation number that we're using? Is it? Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, Regent Lucas, the last I looked at was about the CPI was yeah. about 2.7, no, sorry, 2.2, 2.2%. And the um, HEPI, at the last it was updated, was still over 3. It was 3.7%, the Higher Education Price Index. Regent okay. Lucas? And the other one is how confident are you of the NRNR number that's plugged in there? Hmm. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Lucas, um, 
I'm going to give it over 50 percent, but not super confident. Uh, we do try to be conservative in what actually happens uh, on the last end of this process is we consult with each of our tuition generating units and work with them to understand which components of their tuition are, are going up and by how much. Uh, so we end up with a much more refined tuition estimate. So while we might be a little bit lower <coughs> than anticipated on the NRNR piece, we might actually end up higher on some of the other categories of tuition. So overall, um, you know, I'm, I'm relatively confident, but this one mm, alone, maybe not so much. Thank you. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Johnson Anderson. Um, <laughs> didn't notice that you switched chairs there. Um, so I want to echo what has been said. Uh, this is the spreadsheet that I imagined when I first started four years ago. It's getting closer to actually what I, what I think we need. Um, you probably had it all along. You just didn't show it to us. <laughs> um, I've got a couple technical questions real quickly. Um, so the, the last uh, part of our $90 million operational excellence um, reallocations, is that, is that reflected in this? And then also the other things that we approved today, uh, including the CSE increase, how would we, how would we kind of think about that in, in this? And I'm projecting a huge increase in parking ticket revenue. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Shu, uh, the 90 million is not, you know, as a, if you just think about the 90 million and implementation of that, it isn't in the FY20 projected numbers because it's all going to happen through FY19, the current year. So we think we will hit over 90 million, but that is built into this year's budget already. So the reallocations we would be talking about would be going over and above um, new reallocations starting in FY20. Okay. So then beyond that, and your question on how you think about, for example, the science and engineering surcharge, uh, that revenue is not built into these numbers, first of all, uh, any revenue increase there. It would go directly to the College of Science and Engineering and would be spent on the projects and the, the priorities that, that Dean Cave uh, outlined for you. Those costs in particular are also not specified in the framework. So these are kind of costs over and above the general compensation, for example, which is our biggest expense, and over and above um, sort of a basic level of overhead type spending that, that they're going to have to do. You could think about it, however, as part of a strategic or an investment pool type thing focused on that college, which then takes away maybe from what we would have to provide for them as a strategic investment pool in the rest of the budget. So it, it does um, dovetail in with what you see here, but it is kind of over and above the numbers as we've presented them. Thank you. Chair Anderson. Can't we change chairs on you, sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, the, 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 I think the next step here is really to be able to connect something like this to a strategic plan that um, would help us make the decisions on, you know, where where things need to go up and down and, and whatever, but um, maybe next year. Uh, so one last point. When, when I heard that, um, when I heard our legislative request being presented, I did not attend the meeting, but when I was, uh, when I read the paper and it said that um, even if we were fully funded that we would have to increase tuition by 2%, I was a little bit alarmed and I went back and I looked at the docket materials that were actually um, approved back in October. And we didn't mention the 2%, but we did mention potential of an inflationary increase or more if, if the appropriation stayed flat. And, you know, we're assuming 100% here yet also an additional percentage on top of that for tuition, resident tuition. Um, and since then, we've also approved the NRNR um, tuition increase. So um, I guess it kind of begs the and, oh, last point is that the uh, in that same art in one of the similar or same articles, and I think Minnesota Daily had it. Um, the chair of higher education said that they want the legislature one or at least the Democrats uh, who control now wanted to see uh, us freeze tuition. So what I think, uh, Regent. Um, 
Rocha was going at was possibly um, updating. He didn't say it, I don't think, but um, I'm suggesting that maybe we think about updating our legislative request um, to incorporate a freeze um, so that you know we can have a more uh, a more healthy discussion uh, with them in terms of uh, what the future is for resident uh, resident tuition and you know the last so the last point is just that um, um, oper I think we need to continue operational excellence and it needs to be you know thought about in, in the context of our strategic planning going on uh, I think re uh, senior vice president Burnett is is uh, ready to answer your question about the uh, budget Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Regent Hsu. Uh, to the last point, we agree that because operational excellence is goal of 90 million is being fulfilled in this year, all our scenarios going forward are more reallocations on top. So you can call it operational excellence 2.0. You can, but we aren't building any model that doesn't include more cuts across the board to help be a revenue source in addition to state, hopefully, new state support and tuition. With respect to the state request, my recollection from last September and October was we called Vice President Kramer to the table to talk about should we ask for money to freeze tuition. And we had that discussion around the dice at this committee. And we said that the request we put forth didn't anticipate or contemplate a freeze of tuition or something like that because we had done that the year before and we had asked for the 10 million to freeze tuition and it wasn't granted in the supplemental year the second year of the last biennium so i think what we said was we're looking at something around inflation well something around inflation is around two to two and a half percent when president kaler was asked that question now as we've testified i've testified president kaler's testified we've laid out a pretty um, direct and focused $87 million request that we think is affordable for the legislature. Um, they have asked us what it would take above that to freeze tuition, and we've given those numbers to them. And I think that's the approach we should take. Um, if that's a goal that they want to uh, we can give them that number and have given several legislative leaders that number. But I think that we, when I go back and look at what we did last September and October, um, I think we made a conscious decision after a discussion here not to ask for legislative requests that in, that included a freeze in in-state tuition. Regent Chu. Yes. It, well, I recall that discussion as well, and you know, it, it was so early on in the year that you know we weren't really thinking about um, exactly what we were going to do with tuition. Plus, we never had the we hadn't had the NR and R discussion yet at that point. So it was really early um, to be having that discussion on tuition and. Um, I proposed a freeze for every year that I've been here, and um, I didn't know that we were really going to have that discussion in September, so I wasn't prepared for that. But um, had I been, I would have, uh, I think, been a little bit more uh, conscious and, and forceful in, in suggesting that we do um, initiate on our side, because we do have a freeze on our side, because we do have a lot of opportunity here, and we know the cost of we now know the cost um, uh, of that uh, possibility. And you know, I think we could even go for a reduction based on the numbers that I've seen. Uh, but it, you know, it depends on uh, exactly where we want to spend um, our efforts and our dollars. And um, it's, a, it's a good discussion. I'm glad we're having it now instead of in May, because um, I didn't think we were really having it in October. But you know, if, if that's the way you choose to think about it, we can start discussing a freeze still at this point. Um, because it's still early. Okay, it is, it is a great discussion. I'm glad we're having it here too, and that's what, what's great about this. I'm going to let Senior Vice President uh, Burnett answer, and then we're going to go to Regent Svigum and, and Regent Powell in the hole, and then we'll wrap this up and move on because there's no decision. Quickly, Regent Shu, the reason it's that early is it's the state's requirement that we set, submit our budget request by November. So we have to meet the deadlines for the state to be in the I, cycle. I understand that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, Regent Svigum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Donison, I want to uh, penta my compliments. Is penta a word? Double, triple, quadruple, whatever. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll penta the compliments to you for this framework. <laughs> okay. Um, I think this framework comes together over this next few months as we uh, 
maybe one get the February forecast at this date. By the way, the, the words I've heard from legislators that have been very favorable to our prudent and responsible request. I've heard very favorable uh, uh, comments, at least in respect of the, the budget surplus we have now. Now, uh, you know they're not working on that budget surplus of 1.5 billion. It's the February forecast that we'll work off. It could be two, it could be one, uh, and that will change the perspective a little bit. But uh, at least at this point, it's been very favorable. Um, I'd like to echo, if I could, uh, just make two comments here. First, echo uh, Regent Powell's comments about uh, the framework and what the guiding principles are, the plans. It seems that the two emphases of a guiding plan that we lay out are both, you know, one, status quo at the core, and two, expand any uh, a program service. Uh, like Regent Powell, I'd, li I'd like to see a, uh, at least a uh, recognition of of uh, costs of tuition or recognition of value or something that would be also a leading priority for us other than just spend what we got now and spend on increased investments which is important but but i, th I think we should at least recognize the value mr powell as you've stated the, or the tuition and and the last thing I, I will comment as as we look at putting this framework together as you look at putting it together in the next uh, four months or three months with, with the significant amount of dollars, that 61% that goes to personnel and to uh, costs, it, it seems to me after two years here, the only way we can make any addressing of savings there is, is to look at the head count. Uh, we're not going to do it on salaries. I've convinced myself that's not going to happen. Uh, Regent Johnson is comparing us to uh, the state of Minnesota or Hennepin County. Although we could do it, it ain't going to happen. I've tried. Uh, but I think headcount is where we could maybe make some um, some um, uh, positive addressing, or or and I, and I don't know what the answer is here. Maybe we need to look at just some significant mission that we do at the university. I, we can't be everything for everybody. I've, I've said that before. You know, there's a reason we have Minnesota State to do things that we don't want to duplicate duplicate anything that Minnesota State is doing. Are there some significant, is there a significant mission that we can change or, or not provide uh, from the standpoint of uh, what the university is doing? And I don't, Julie, I don't even know what it is. I don't, I don't know what it might even be. I'd like to see the list and say, you know, this maybe we shouldn't be doing. This is better at Minnesota State, or maybe it's not even better for higher education to be doing it anyway. But uh, I think headcount or some mission change. Well, thank you, you, you Mr. Chairman. Okay. I apologize. That's fine. No, thank you. That's, those are good. Those are good thoughts, Regent Spigum. Uh, Regent Paul. Um, thanks, Chairman. I'll be. I'll be brief. I'm going to refer back to a comment that Regent Beeson made. Where it, we're, you know, we're in this tough fiscal environment. We, 90, 91 million dollars that we found to save. It's good work led by the president. But we know that we're going to have to continue that work going forward. And Regent Beeson commented on, um, you know, process excellence which is becoming very prevalent, you know, in, and certainly in, in institutions of our size. I mean, we're, we're big, 26,000 employees, lots of complexity. And so I, I think I would, we know we're going to need to do the continue. I think we need new thinking and a plan. And I would really urge and suggest um, to Senior Vice President Burnett, you know, with the support of the president, that we try to get a little head start on this and either look Consider whether we need an internal capability around process excellence, which would not be unusual at all for an institution our size, or third-party uh, advice. There's lots of people out there, they, they, they do this for a living. And, um, and, and just as a way to sort of start to frame up and get new thinking on how we're going to approach this, I think it would be really helpful to the incoming president if we if, if uh, uh, Vice President Bernard, if, you, if you'd had a chance to really, hey, we've got some ideas here on how to take, you know, 2.0 um, uh, of, uh, of, of reallocation. So that's the thought. Good point. Very good point. Uh, Regional Mari has tugged on me to have a moment, so go ahead, Regional Thank you, Mari. Chair Anderson. Uh, um, I just, uh, I, we're in a, a right versus right dilemma, which is we should cut and try to save costs, and at the same time, when we cut, oftentimes it impacts what we do as a mission. Uh, in an institution. And so before or as part of having this conversation of the 2.0, I think we also need to know what does it do to working conditions? What does it do to students? 
uh, and the, the services that they receive to be successful at this institution and, and how that either makes it a better institution from quality or less uh, quality for the student. Because I know that uh, units are cutting and they're filling the cuts and that impacts our students and our workforce. And so we need to have these two conversations in conjunction. Otherwise, we're going to cut um, in a way that will not make us excellent and excellent and it'll actually do the opposite. Thank you very much. Uh, Associate Vice President Tonneson, thanks for your time so much today. And I don't know if we still have you on the agenda for anything more, but uh, you've done great work already. So thank you. Um, in the, uh, in the, uh, the, the chair is just going to make a motion. Our, our next, or not a motion, a, a decision. The next item, item six on the uh, agenda, is our annual report on workforce and total compensation. I do look at my clock and it says 10.06 and we have other meetings starting at 11. So at this time, we need to give that the time it deserves and the time it needs to, and we're not making a decision on it. So at this time, I'm going to set that aside and ask <coughs> a step because there are things we do have to make decisions on today prior to 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm going to move to item number seven, which is a collective bargaining agreement. Um, and um, that's the AFSCI local 39, 37, 3801. And I think Vice President Brown and Senior Director Dion are going to present to us. And uh, then we'll keep moving forward from that point. If we have time at the end, we will talk about the report on workforce and total compensation. Otherwise, that may have to be rescheduled. So, uh, <coughs> Vice President uh, Brown, if you want to lead us through the uh, collective bargaining agreement. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, we have a collective bargaining agreement with our AFSCME technical unit. And I will let Patty Dion describe the details of that. Thank you, Vice President Brown. Uh, I uh, am pleased to be here. Uh, Chair Anderson, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett, uh, President Kaler, and members of the committee to bring to you today the labor agreement that we have negotiated with the Technical <coughs> Employee Group. And this group is represented by AFSCME, which is the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. There are about 760 employees in this unit. These employees work on all of our campuses and on our research and outreach centers. There's a wide variety of work that is found in this unit. These employees are veterinary technicians, laboratory technicians, information technology specialists, library assistants, sign language interpreters, child care workers, just to name a few. This is a one-year contract which covers the time period from July 1st, 2018 through June 30th, 2019. This is a mature contract. AFSCME, AFSCME has represented the technical unit here at the university for 25 years. And this settlement is pretty straightforward. The negotiations focus primarily on wages. Our settlement consists of a 2% salary pool, which is consistent with our other employee groups. Employees in this unit receive their pay in two ways. One way is through the movement of the wage scale, and the other is through the movement or progression of employees through that wage scale. So our settlement for this group is to move the wage scale by 1%, and then to also provide for the cost of the progression through that wage scale, and the cost of that progression for this employee group is 1%. There were a few agreements regarding language. We agreed to continue to meet regarding issues related to a respectful workplace. And we also agreed to our parental leave program for this group of employees that is equivalent to our other employee groups across the university. So with that, we ask for your approval of this labor agreement. Thank you. So is there a motion to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with Ask Me Local 3937 and 3801 technical employees? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of this agreement signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, you very much. And uh, <laughs> Vice President Brown, you just wait, we might get you back. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll move on to uh, item number eight, our capital budget amendment on the Volleyball Performance Center Remodel Maturity Pavilion. I think we've got somebody from Design, Bruce Gritters, and I think Athletic Director Coyle are maybe here. Uh, and Ms. Ewell is setting up the video. Thank you. You people can go ahead whenever you're ready. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Uh, the University Athletics Department is remodeling 7,000 square feet of uh, space in uh, uh, the Maturi Pavilion assigned to the Gopher Women's Volleyball. This is a really great, exciting project. Um, we're happy to be part of it. Um, it's, it's really going to take it to the next level. Uh, you'll see on the first level, if you're familiar with the area, <laughs> there'll be uh, locker rooms, uh, strength and conditioning area, hydrotherapy tub with space to add a second tub. Um, and then moving to the uh, adjacent to that, you'll see a new trainer's room. On the second level, um, coaches' offices, conference rooms, student and recruiting lounges, as well as premium seating overlooking the court area. So it's really going to be exciting and great space. Uh, Mark will now speak to the program need. Yeah, uh, good morning. And as you know, we have a volleyball program that has been achieving at a high, high level for the past several years. Uh, arguably, we have the best uh, collegiate volleyball coach in the country. And uh, there's no doubt that this facility, this uh, performance center will have a huge impact not only on the experience that we give to our current student athletes, but also in our recruiting process to make sure we bring the type of uh, young women we want to come here and compete at a high level for national championships, which is our expectation for that program. Thank you. Um, you know, you've got Regent okay. Lucas here, who's yeah. your number one fan. <laughs> Keep going. Yeah, all right. Um, so uh, donor funds are making this project a reality. Um, the, the $4 million project is funded primarily by three point. Eight million of either cash or pledges for the donor. So, again, donor funding really makes this thing go. Uh, the project schedule aggressive, um, but we're, we're achieving it. Um, the design will be complete in March, and uh, occupancy, partial occupancy, in August in time for the season. So, again, um, it's an exciting, challenging project. Mortensen Construction is doing the construction portion, and JLG Architects are doing the design. And with that, we're ready for any questions. Okay, terrific. Uh, I think before we get to questions, uh, is there a motion to approve this? And we'll get it out. So moved. So second. moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. It's been moved and approved to uh, recommend the, the capital improvement budget for the Volleyball Performance Center remodel. Uh, with that said, is there any discussion? Regent Lucas, the number one fan. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I'm really pleased to support this. Um, I've been a season ticket to volleyball for over 20 years, and it's amazing how little volleyball has asked of us all this time. And we have a coach that is not demanding, is the best in the country, and we should be so pleased about that. But this, this really takes it to a higher level. Um, but I'd like to point out that the Olympic sports have a harder time getting first-class facilities because and so even though this will take care of volleyball, there's the gymnastics and there are other there are other issues standing behind this that we have to address. Um, the basketball women's basketball program gets taken care of through Title IX by the Athletic Village. They come in and they measure and they say how many seats, how many this, how many that, and they they have a world class uh, facility just because there's a men's basketball team. But since we don't have a men's volleyball team, this is something that has to be done on its own. So I'm really pleased that this is happening. The donor generosity has been quick and gratifying, and I'm really happy to see this go forward. Regent Shu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Thank you, presenters. Um, I remember having a conversation with the um, volleyball coach several years ago, and I asked him, what do you need to get to the next level? And this is exactly what he described. And the fact that just a few years later, it's becoming reality is, I think, terrific for everybody, including the athletes. Um, one question one question that I have around the premium seating is, is that seating going to be available for other events as pre premium seating, or is it just for volleyball? Athletic Director Coyle. Yeah, Chair Anderson and, and Regent Sue, that would be available for the other events that take place in that facility. So uh, Matri Pavilion also hosts uh, both gymnastics program and a uh -huh. wrestling program. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Terrific. Looks good. I have a question. The, the 200000 from athletics, one-time payment coming out of the annual budget. We continue, uh, Chair Anderson, we continue to actively fundraise, uh, but that's how we would handle it if the fundraising. Okay, thank you. Um, no more questions. I'm going to ask for the vote. All those in favor of the remodel of Maturi Pavilion, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you, so now we're on to uh, item number nine. 
resolution. We're almost catching up. Well, we're not quite. We got the <laughs> Vice President Brown out. <laughs> uh, resolution related to the approval and financing of the purchase of uh, University Village on the Twin Cities campus. This is just for review today, but I figured we probably have a discussion on it. We are not voting on it, so we can we can go till about ten thirty-five or so. We got uh, some time to talk. Um, Senior Vice President Burnett, are you going to lead us through it? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And uh, I'll kick this off and then we'll turn it over to uh, Assistant Vice President Krieger and Chief Investment Officer Mason for the details. But briefly, as we discussed last fall, the university would submit to the regents um, uh, acquiring the parcel of the University Village just east of the Twin Cities East Bank campus. Um, due to its strategic value, impact to cost of attendance, and as an investment vehicle for the university. As you know, it's just east of the Days Inn property that we are a joint venture partner with, and it's, uh, it's very strategic in terms of location, but also in terms of cost of attendance. It is one of the lower cost student housing options near the campus, in part because it was built by the Weedham Foundation, a nonprofit foundation um, that uh, was able to bring this to us. And I guess I should point out, and I'm, I'm fairly certain that, that the board understands that the Weedham Foundation approached the university about acquiring this uh, parcel. Um, as you might know, not all of our students can afford the high end, some of the high end um, student housing that's been built. And so this, this um, facility actually helps keep prices reasonable in that regard uh, in a very key location. Acquiring the parcel also presents a reasonable investment opportunity both in terms of the long-term land values as well as we approach the approach we're going to take in financing the property. In September, you approve the creation of a private entity for the acquisition of this site. Consistent with this action, we form 2515 LLC with the help of our Office of General Counsel. Tremendous help there. And it is a nonprofit limited liability company. Originally, we had discussed with you a potential partner in this LLC, but after further deliberations, including understanding our partners, potential partners' mission and complexities regarding the future development of the site, the universities determined that the best course of action would be for the university to be the sole member of this proposed LLC. The LLC will have authority extended to it by the Board of Regents. Um, and contrary um, to this last bullet here, we don't anticipate assuming any debt um, on that. We're going to uh, essentially buy the property outright. And um, Chief Investment Officer Mason will walk through that. So with that, I would like to turn the rest of the presentation over to Vice, Assistant Vice President Krieger and, and Stuart Mason for the presentation. Hey, people. Chair Anderson, members of the committee, I'm now going to spend just a couple of minutes briefly going over, giving you an overview of the property and the real estate transaction. University Village is a mixed-use residential and retail property with 199 residential units, approximately 24,000 square feet of retail space, 373 parking stalls, and it sits on 4.27 acres of land. Uh, as Senior Vice President Burnett noted the property is located adjacent to the 2407 joint venture property in close and in close proximity to the Stadium Village retail uh, uh, Stadium Village light rail station. I would also note that it is just south of the new Rec Sports bubble, uh, just located to the north here on your screen. Oh, it's not showing. Sorry. Uh, 2515 University Avenue Southeast is a facility that we, the university is very familiar with. Uh, the bu building, um, as well as we are also very familiar with Great Lakes Management Company, the property manager of the facility. Housing and Residential Life has had a master lease for 112 units in the facility since 1999. This, this master lease terminates in <coughs> August of 2019 and will not be extended as part of the university's long-term housing plan that was reviewed by the board back in 2016. In addition to the 199 apartment units, the uh, original property developer has a master lease for the retail property, the 24,000 square feet, uh, and that master lease extends until 2039. As I mentioned, Great Lakes, proper, Great Lakes Management Company uh, and our familiarity with them, they have managed the property since its construction and have an excellent track, work, track record. The 2515 LLC 
intends to continue to contract with Great Lakes Management to manage the property ongoing. As you are aware from the university's previous projects in this vicinity, this area of the city has, historic, has a history of industrial use, and this property is no different. Uh, historic uses for the property include a refrigerator manufacturing company, an electric generator manufacturing company, a foundry, and filling stations. As part of the due diligence process, the phase one environmental assessment identified areas of concern that would, be need, that would need to be further explored during a phase two. During the phase two testing, which included sub-slab vapor testing, uh, we discovered additional environmental conditions which have resulted in the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency requiring the installation of a vapor intrusion mitigation system. This system is similar in concept to what homeowners install in their basements to mitigate radon, just at a much larger scale. The university is currently working with the seller on this issue and the installation of the vapor intrusion mitigation system is underway and is on schedule to, for completion prior to the university closing on the property. In addition to these, in addition to these immediate remediation measures, Long term, we do expect that when the site is ultimately redeveloped, additional soil, media, re, soil remediation will be required. And now to summarize the transaction. We will be asking the Board of Regents approval in March for the 2515 University Avenue Southeast LLC to acquire the property for $43 million. This price is consistent with the two appraisals we conducted for a nonprofit entity acquiring the property. The purchase and sale agreement required an initial $500,000 of earnest money and an additional $250,000 of earnest money to extend the closing to March 29, 2019 in order to have time for the university's contractors to, des to design and install the vapor intrusion mitigation system. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Investment Officer Stuart Mason to provide you an overview of the financial structure of the acquisition. Thank you. So when this property became available uh, and we began consideration of purchase of this property, uh, Senior Vice President Burnett uh, came to the Office of Investments and Banking and asked us to evaluate various financing alternatives that might be available to finance the purchase. We considered external financing, which of course uses uh, University of Minnesota debt capacity, uh, but would uh, float debt in the external capital markets. We considered assuming a HUD guaranteed mortgage for approximately $20 million that is existing on the property and adding to that additional financing. And we considered um, entire internal financing options. So I'd like to briefly discuss with you the proposed debt structure that we feel optimizes the opportunity for uh, financing um, the acquisition of the property. Uh, it does require um, uh, waiving a couple of um, provisions within existing investment policies. And the debt structure comes with a proposed uh, depreciation reserve to be established for contingency purposes. So very briefly, uh, we're proposing and we'll ask, uh, the resolution will ask you to approve a $45.5 million uh, acquisition financing package. The additional half million dollars is intended to um, address acquisition uh, and closing costs, uh, miscellane miscellaneous acquisition and closing costs. The structure will be two loans, each of which will have a $30 million, excuse me, 30 year amortization with a five year interest only provision. The total debt um, capital cost to the uh, property will be 5.2% weighted average cost of capital, and that will be segregated into two different mortgages, a senior secured mortgage, which is approximately $35 million, that will be purchased by the TIP pool of capital, the temporary investment pool of capital, and an $8.7 million subordinated mortgage that will be purchased by the endowment fund. Both will be secured by land buildings assignment in favor of the university of all leases, rents, contracts, and so forth. Um, when we considered this uh, proposal, uh, proposed financing, we, it, we did so through the lens of 
some of the guiding principles that we had established initially. As Senior Vice President Burnett has already mentioned, this preserves a um, lower cost uh, housing option for all the students on the East Bank. Um, it has operated at a below average market rate for uh, the entire period in which it's been occupied. And we think preserving that option for students uh, is critical uh, uh, to the overall mix of housing that the, student, uh, that the university offers uh, students. Um, it also is a very attractive investment for both the TIP and its criteria for investments, as well as the endowment pool, the way we have structured it. Um, one of the overriding factors was we, we determined that it would be better to use the existing cash flow which in the last, the prior couple of years has been approximately 2.6 or $2.7 million of free cash flow. It, it would be better to structure something where that cash flow flowed to the university rather than flowed out to the external capital markets. So it is a self-sustaining operating entity generating cash flow and the structure of this debt captures that flow, cash flow as additional revenue into the university. <clears throat> this page is intended to show you, or to, to underscore the um, point I've made about uh, attractive investment for both TIP and CEF. On the left-hand side of this page, you see the asset allocation in the temporary investment pool, which is a pool of approximately a billion dollars, a majority of which is invested by uh, colleagues of mine in the Office of Investments and Banking in, directly in um, high-grade securities whose average return is um, anywhere from two to three percent. At the very lower end in red, you can see we've made a couple of investments that are higher yielding, and we would place the mortgage uh, with a coupon of four and a half percent, we'd place that mortgage in the higher yielding portion of TIP. It fits very well alongside of other less liquid or illiquid securities, um, one of which being is the investment in the endowment pool, which produces approximately eight or nine percent. There's another higher, higher yielding nine or ten percent um, senior secured loan pool uh, that is currently there and we continue to seek other options such as mortgages and so forth that are higher yielding that might have um, um, constricted uh, liquidity attached to them. For the investment in, that's in, indicated for the endowment pool, there is a portion or a bucket within the diversifiers pool that we um, that we call enhanced stability. And the enhanced stability is higher yielding fixed income instruments. The objective there is anything that earns CPI plus five. Those CPI plus five, given your assumption on, on, um, on inflation is somewhere in the seven and a half to eight percent. So a, an eight percent mortgage, long term, high quality, fully secured from the University of Minnesota uh, is something that fits very neatly and very attractively into that bucket within um, the CEF pool. I think two other elements um, that I mentioned in terms of the structure. The first of all, uh, we, have, we have spent a lot of time creating a, a base case of projections. Uh, so that we are very comfortable with the ongoing existing with the existing and the ongoing cash flow uh, for these two particular loans. We've listed some of the key assumptions here. I think I'd like to turn the page uh, to talk with you a little bit about the waivers which would be necessary to make the investments in both the tip and the endowment pool. Um, as you can see from this page, in the investments of reserve policy, which is a uh, our regents policy, there are two provisions that would need to be waived specifically for the purchase of this security. The first is listed in the upper portion of the box highlighted in yellow. Um, the provision states that the average duration of four years or less on the entire portfolio, but a maximum duration of seven years on any individual holding within the tip pool. If we're to purchase a 30-year mortgage, uh, the average duration uh, for that particular 
piece of paper will be in the high teens of years. It will uh, be outside the bounds of the maximum that's stated in this portion of the policy. It's useful to note that within the TIP pool, there are outside managers who purchase securities that do not um, comply with these restrictions. Uh, it's only the direct investments that are made by my office which need to follow these restrictions. So we're asking for a waiver, a one-time waiver for that particular uh, portion of the policy so that we can purchase this security. The other portion uh, of this policy that would need a waiver are the three highlighted in the, the bottom portion of this left-hand box. We are prohibited from currently from buying unrated securities, and this would not be, from private or illiquid securities, this would be that, and securities not traded on a major exchange, uh, which of course this would not be. It's, it's important to say that the outside managers we use for some of the portions of TIP um, have many of these securities within their portfolios, but we are prohibited um, from buying directly into the TIP pool securities that have these characteristics. The other portion of the waiver that we are seeking is in the endowment pool. The endowment pool allows us to make direct investments in securities, and we do that. However, the um, restriction there is that we are to make investments directly in securities where an existing outside manager, a venture capitalist, a private equity manager, or something like that, has, is making a similar investment where we can leverage their um, due diligence capabilities and our previous experience with that manager. But this doesn't have an associated outside manager attached to it, and so by strict reading of this portion of the policy, we would ask for a waiver um, for that um, element as well. The final piece that I'd like to um, uh, discuss briefly with you is we are, as part of the proposal, we are asking that a depreciation reserve be created by taking a portion of the interest that comes into the university on the tip portion of the mortgage, that portion which exceeds the average return in tip over the course of the first five years. So if you think about tip earning 2.5% today, the mortgage being 4.5%, we are asking that that excess return of 2% during the interest only period be set aside in a depreciation reserve to handle contingencies that, that might result from our modeling or our assumptions being incorrect in the first couple of years in which we are beginning uh, to operate this facility totally on our own. Um, it can be set aside for periods of time over the course of the life of the mortgage where other unforeseen needs might arise. It could be additional debt um, reduction, or it could be capital expenditures that may be required um, that are currently unforeseen. So that would end my comments and open questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mason. So, so the reserve fund is basically like a homeowner that has a reserve fund in case things come up and things like that. That's your intent on that. Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm going to ask Senior Vice President Burnett just to briefly walk us through what has to be done here? We're not deciding today, but what is the process for what we're going to do for the next meeting? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Just quickly, the resolution that we would be bringing forth in March um, is, is in front of you. But essentially, it's, it's essentially bringing to life the LLC that you had already approved um, creation of and setting some boundaries around its operation and um, approving this financing structure with these exceptions that um, Chief Investment Officer Mason has put forth. So today is just review. We obviously have some time between now and the March meeting if there's any follow-up questions, but this was to put this transaction that many people put a lot of hours in and thought into, but I think overall it's a very good economic decision and that preserves some strategic land on the east part of the campus, and we look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Regent Chu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, thank you, presenters. Uh, I, I support purchasing the property, but I, this just seems very complicated 
um, we purchased another building from, I think, Keeler from the same seller, did not have the same, um, it didn't have to have a special vehicle to do it. Um, I'm, and I understand that, you know, at one point we thought we were going to have a partner yeah. in this, and we had a lot of discussion about why this vehicle needed to be created in the first place, and I'm, I think you kind of lost me. It, you know, if, if this is a vehicle to help, you know, tip, make money, then I think we're, we're not doing what we said we were going to do in terms of keeping um, the cost of housing down. Uh, if we're actually, you know, trying to make money off of it, whereas we could just actually make less money and have lower rates for students. So I'm trying to understand what is the real goal here and why, why is it that we still need to have this vehicle instead of just purchasing, um, purchasing the property like we did the other ones. You know, I'm going to let Senior Vice President Burnett answer that, but I kind of see it as we are getting a lower interest rate for the property to build cash flow, and the investment pool is getting a higher interest rate than they'd normally get, and it's kind of a win-win for each, but I'll let Senior Vice President Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regent Chu, a couple of things. This um, is different than Keeler, that it has ongoing leases that last over 20 years that we want to honor and not contemplate buying out that prevent that provide free cash flow above and beyond the student housing. Part of the reason that the rents are lower is it was built by a nonprofit. It's been exempt from property taxes since its inception. Putting it in this LLC's hands under the Regents keeps the property taxes off, which keeps that delta down. And so we aren't contemplating that the debt structure that we've put forth would change the rents at all. But part of it is this is a unique both um, commercial uh, establishment with some environmental challenges on top of being student housing. So in that sense, it's more complex than the Keeler acquisition. That's what I could offer for you. Regent Shu. Thank you. And I understand some of those benefits, and we would receive those benefits as, you know, if we purchased it, you know, we wouldn't pay property tax if we purchased it just as the university. So um, I'm trying to understand what the real benefits here are. Um, obviously, there are some. But it just seems like a very complex transaction to, to try and achieve those. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Senior Vice President Burnett. Um, Regent Hsu and members of the board, we, this would not use our balance sheet. This would use our investment accounts to make this acquisition. That's what's unique about it. And no question, it's more complex. And I don't see us doing a lot of these. But in this case, with this type of structure, when we sat down and put our heads together about issuing debt in the capital markets, we could do that to acquire this. We saw an opportunity because we'll have control over this as the LLC to ensure that our returns come back to SEF and to TIP. At the same time, we preserve the land for future university use down the road. So in this case, we felt that the more complex structure made more sense to us for both the return to the endowment, the security it brings to us, and the TIP, and us having control as a sole owner LLC. We're going to keep moving on because we're not deciding this issue today, and we do have another meeting at 11. But uh, Regent Sviggum, I want to get everybody to ask, at least ask their questions, and then. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, um, Stuart, uh, Mr. Mason. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend across the aisle here uh, has, in his minimal uh, math, figured out, uh, Regent Johnson, that this is nine million dollars an acre. <laughs> Would you be interested in a little more acreage, about fifty-five miles south of here? <laughs> <laughs> Um, just, just kidding. Um, I uh, was somewhat concerned when I looked at the proposal, just from a big picture that we, uh, as a university, what our plan, what our mission is uh, for the use of that property right now. We really don't have a plan or a need or a mission right now, from what I understand. But my second concern was uh, that we would be taking properties off the tax rolls in St. Paul, which already has significant uh, non-taxable property, as Mr. Beeson knows. Uh, but is it true that this property already does is off the tax rolls? It's it's not paying property tax. Yep. Yeah, uh, Regents Figum. Uh, yes, it is. It's own. It's currently owned by uh, the Weedham Foundation and was built and constructed and op has been operated for the first twenty years as a nonprofit entity. So it is not paying real estate tax currently. So that concern that I had, the second concern, is not of real value because it would not be taking property off the rolls. Correct. You are correct. 
We've been schooled well, though, that in St. Paul, there's so much uh, property that is non-taxable that uh, it, it really causes a burden upon homeowners and businesses uh, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise. So I just want to make sure yep. I clarified that. Okay. Oh, Regent Anderson yes. and uh, Cherry Anderson, Regent Sviggum. I would like to clarify, though, that the retail portion of the property yep. it does play, pay the equivalent in terms of property taxes. Mm -hmm. Um, could I get a clarification to what that means? I don't, I don't know what you mean. So, uh, uh, Cherry Anderson, Regent Sviggum, I just wanted to clarify that the Weedham Foundation, the nonprofit entity, is the owner of the property. Uh, the 24,000 square feet of retail, which is under a master lease, right, that right. master lease holder pays the equivalent of property taxes for the retail portion because that is not considered nonprofit. Okay, so, Mr. Chairman, what that means is in they don't pay property tax, but in lieu of property tax they do make it's a, a payment it's the, a personal property tax it's a it's another type of tax that okay. we would continue and that's about that's where uh, i know enough so to be dangerous on that we would be reducing the resources to the city of no. st paul to some no of you know, and um, no point choice. of clarification region uh, region Sigum, does Sigum. another type of tax surprise you yeah <laughs> 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 Uh, first point of we, we, clarification, we, the, the property is located in the city of Minneapolis, oh, uh, if that makes a difference. Uh, no, no, but that is... Minneapolis has got the same problem. <laughs> it has the same problem. But I just wanted to clarify that there are some taxes being paid on the property for the retail component of the property. And that would continue. And that, and that will, will continue. continue. That we continue. Yes. Well, it's it's going to maintain an oranges, oranges. From yes. There. Yes, sir. Again, we are not making a decision on this today, and we do have another item we have to approve, and I've got five reasons that want to talk, so if I can move on for about a minute apiece for each of you. Uh, we, you know, and I wouldn't do this, but we do have another meeting at 11, guys. Uh, Regional Mari. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this is something that I, I raised previously. I, I, I'm supportive of this. I think it's, it's a good investment, and, and it makes sense. Um, I am curious to know at some point what our strategy slash vision is for how many uh, public-private partnerships we might be pursuing and creating LLCs to, to buy properties like this. Um, I'm glad we have that depreciation uh, reserve because, as I recall the building from about 10 years ago, it's not a great building. Um, and so I'm a little bit worried about the upkeep of the building. I don't know y'all are thinking about that. Um, and then the question that I have is, so those master leases with the retail last, I think you said till 2039? Um, so what happens if we wanted to redevelop the site? Can we not, are we bound to not do that? I, 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 mean, I can probably answer that. I think you have a, you have a choice to buy out the leases or okay. things. I mean, there would be options, but that not necessarily that we would take them. Is that correct? That is correct. So if that I can, Regional Mari, part of the reason we don't want to redevelop anytime soon, the free cash flow to pay back our investment, those are paying for this acquisition. So again, if we wanted to, end those leases soon, you would have the option to buy them out at some negotiated price. So we're confident that the, the facility will be in good enough shape to house our students there for the next 20, 20 years? Chair Anderson, Regent Omari, uh, as part of the due diligence process, we did conduct a facility condition assessment of the property. Uh, and so we have a good handle of what those needs are long term. The, uh, the property owner replaced the entire roof of the property this past year, and about three hundred sixty dollars to $370,000 a year is put into regular repair and maintenance right. of the units. And so we have a good handle on what those long-term costs are as well as the, the ongoing. It's been well-maintained over, uh, um, over its lifetime, and so we have a good handle on what those costs are. It's not the fanciest property, uh, but it is a good value, and it's been well, very well maintained. Okay. Thank you. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, presenters. Um, it isn't very often where we get an investment that checks a lot of boxes. And so what this one does, unlike other um, purchases, it's an earning asset. It's not a piece of vacant ground. Right. And um, the fact that we're charging ourselves a market rate of interest doesn't mean that we have to raise the rents inside the building. Just means we're achieving the superior return. I think it does preserve the building as an affordable housing project, which is not unimportant. And it gives us the flexibility to either partner or go on our own or and work with the property 
that we own with our partner next door or to do this separately. I think it gives us um, all the flexibility we want and that there is some uncertainty by, but we are playing the role of developer uh, and that has uncertainty, it has some risk, but this is pretty well mitigated, I think, by the by the um, business plan that you've laid out. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Beeson. Regent Powell. Um, thanks, um, Chair Anderson, and thanks, um, presenters. I think it'd be helpful if um, at the next meeting we, we can see um, just a, 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 a P&L for, for the property. I mean, a significant portion is going to come from um, the student rents, but I, I mean, I have no idea how much of it comes from the commercial side uh, and would also be interesting, I think, to see what the major components is the cash flow primarily generated from the from the retail side. And, the, and, and if we know that, I think we can think a little more clearly about mm -hmm. um, the risks, potential risks that Regent Beeson Be Be just outlined. So anyway, if we can see a full p and I think that that'd be helpful. 57% margins. It sounds it's it's a nice margin. Mm -hmm. and, and I would suggest we get that in the next week or 10 days if it's not too hard. So it gives us time to talk about it before the March meeting. Uh, Regent Lucas. Thank you. I'll be quick. Um, I, I, I looked at real estate deals for 30 years, and this, this is a win-win, and I congratulate you for coming to that point. And I really echo the uh, support for the depreciation reserve. I watched that building go up, and it was not built for the ages. And um, so I think it's really comforting to have that set aside in case something comes up. Thank you for the proposal. Mm -hmm. And Regent Rolshaw, final word. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I actually have a um, comment, follow question, and maybe a follow-up, but short. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I've been wired for 30 years that any time property adjacent to the campus or near the campus becomes available, we, we acquire it. And I think Regent Omari's concerns are, are, are well-founded, but I would much rather be in the position of owning it with the leases than not owning it with the leases for future use, although I don't know that we would ever do a an eminent domain over a lease and a property that we own, but that's another question if you'd have someone that wouldn't choose to, to, to make a deal. My, my question is with, with and, you know, this is, this is a complex um, uh, arrangement, w would we be, and you may have answered this question and I missed it, but would we be able to achieve the same values, could we do the same funding mechanism if it were simply owned outright by the university, or does it require the separate corporate entity to do it? And then I have a, potentially a follow-up based on the answer. The um, the LLC uh, uh, region the question is about the LLC. Sure. Yes, sir. The the LLC that was created, if you remember the conversation uh, from last fall was created to insulate the university from a variety of different uh, liability risks, primarily. The financing part could have been done internally, uh, but the LLC makes an purchasing an operating company with the complexities of an oper ongoing operating company uh, is a, a different element. So it's a liability-related issue. It's not a financing-related issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I'm more convinced, or compelled rather, by the second part of your answer. The liability part of it, I mean, the university is, it's our money, right? I mean, I, I, my, it seems unlikely that we're going to be sitting with a $50 million liability against a $43 million asset, and we're going to walk away and make someone sue the, the insolvent LLC. It, it, the university's, we're, we're underneath this thing. So the, I, the liability factor I don't think is really as compelling. Maybe it does make more sense because of the unique nature, and then this is sort of building off of Regent Omari and, and then Regent Simonson's longstanding uh, question. If this makes sense in this setting, are there other properties on this campus or any of our campuses that would also give us the ability to increase our return for our investments but also reduce the cost to the institution where we have a facility, whether it's a student center or other thing, where there might be the ability to... To, to, to capture that, this could this could potentially be a model for exactly. I think the vice president can answer that here. Just quickly, we would look at it on a case by case basis, Regent Rocha. I think back to this is an earn, earning asset, right? And, right? and that also provides this benefit of the lower cost housing. Um, a lot of what we buy is vacant land that doesn't have any return. So I think it's just a case by case basis. And I think even tomorrow, there's going to be a longer discussion about what you just teed up. I mean, at least with respect to the East Bank and the East Gateway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Kruger and Mason. And uh, I'm going to have to say uh, 
My apologies on all of you who attended to hear the annual report on workforce and total compensation. We are probably not going to get that to that to our next meeting, and I apologize for that. But we had important discussions on things we had to have discussion on today and things we had to reach decisions on. The final item on the, on the agenda is item 10 is a consent report. And the consent report includes the, cent, the Central Reserve's general contingency, purchase of goods and services of $1 million and over, an amendment to the employment agreement for the football offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, on the Twin Cities campus, amendments to the civil service employment rules, a capital budget amendment for M Health Clinics and Surgery Center leasehold improvements on the Twin Cities campus, and schematic designs. Before I ask if there are items that committee members would like to separate out, are there any questions on the uh, consent report? Regent Paul. Quick one, Chair. Um, and this has to do with purchases over a million. The EAB Global, who support our international you know, studies abroad, it's 15 million. It's a big number. Do, is that um, is that fully compensated through the cost of the program? Or I had questions on that too. And I, the other thing I thought is a multi-year contract. Is, Mr. Chairman and uh, Regent Powell, that is a multi-year, and it is covered with the cost the students pay that go abroad. But it's a big contract for multiple countries in multiple years. But that is not something that comes out of O and M. It comes out of fees paid by students that travel study abroad. Thank you. Any other questions? Sure. Richard Chu. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, yeah, I had a question about the EAB Global also. I think that's different than the study abroad one. It is. Um, but the EAB Global, I'm, I'm a little bit interested in what, um, what they're actually doing in terms of marketing services for um, our Office of Admissions. Is there any more detail other than what's in here? Do you have that answer, Senior Vice President mm, Burnett? I, I can get some help from the studio audience potentially, but I will tell you this is a marketing, this is a outsourced marketing that they do to, to build your pools. And EAB, um, I, I believe that the Twin Cities campus has changed their provider and, and uh, to this provider, and this is also a multi-year contract, but this is how you build a national pool of applicants for your particularly undergraduate classes. And that's what this is, and we can get you more details on that before tomorrow's vote on the on the full consent okay. agenda. It's a million like. dollars a year, and I'm just wondering what kind of marketing we're getting for well, that. I think that's a three-year. If you it's March of okay. 19 through June of 2022, so it's a three-year. Yeah, so it's three million dollars for three years. So right, million dollars a year. Is what I said. So yeah. Yeah. No yes, we um, So on the um, on the coach's contract. I just want to point out um, two things. One is there's a typo. I don't know if it matters, but award is misspelled in one of the categories um, for bonuses. And then uh, I would also like to uh, suggest that we have a bigger bonus for uh, winning a Big Ten championship. It's only ten thousand dollars, and I think. It's, uh, <laughs> I think uh, if we ever get there, I mean, we haven't won one. My suggestion was if, if you're serious, I mean, I'm, I'm all for that too, but if you're serious about it, put it in a motion form tomorrow and we can get it in the uh, in the final vote tomorrow. Is that okay with you, Chair uh, McMillan? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure Coach Fleck and, and Coach Taraka would be happy. They're not going to fight it. All right, we'll talk about that later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask for a motion to accept the, uh, the uh, to approve the uh, Central Reserves um, excuse me, to the uh, consent report here and uh, finance and operations. I'll move to second. And moved and seconded. Any discussion on any of the items? All those in favor of uh, approving the consent report signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And uh, I think the last thing, information items are in your docket, and I think uh, there's an audit meeting in six minutes and a litigation review meeting in six minutes. So I think with that, meeting is adjourned.